Am I the asshole for dumping my ex publicly and not paying him back for the engagement ring? I just want to say that this is going to sound insane, but I'm not trolling or making it up. Me and this guy were together for three years. We are 19 now. We never talked about the future until a year in. Before then, I would try to discuss it and he would change the subject. In short, I wanted kids and he didn't. I wanted to stay in Ireland and he didn't. I wanted to get married, he didn't. When I realized that it was a bad match, I broke it off, but he asked me to get back together, saying we were too young to worry about the future, and so we got back together. This happened a few times over the next 18 months. In this time, we probably spent more time apart than together. We knew early on that we wanted different things, and while marriage and kids is something that I would want further down the line, I wasn't concerned about his open dislike of marriage and kids because 19 is too young to get married anyway. If I were dating him 10 or 15 years from now and he didn't want to get married, then I might have an issue. But when I'm barely out of my teens, it's not a huge concern, and just loving him and wanting to be with him is enough. When I went to see him this time, I was again considering breaking up with him. Aside from the long-term issues, he is also inconsiderate and has a mean streak that I really don't like. So when I arrived at his place, mentally debating breaking up with him for good this time, and he told me that he wanted to take me out to dinner, I assumed that he wanted to break up too, publicly so I wouldn't cause a scene. I don't normally cause a scene, but being in public tends to prevent yelling, and we both yell every time that we break up. In the last year, he has asked me two things that, looking back now, stand out to me. First, he asked about jewelry, what kind of stuff I liked and what my taste was. I assumed it was because my birthday was coming up and he was getting me a bracelet or something. So I told him simple and delicate, silver or steel rather than gold. If there was a color, then blue. Nothing flashy or expensive, as my job prefers plain jewellery, and it's just my personal preference. I also said, go cheap. The other thing that he asked me was how I felt about public proposals. I told him immediately that I, personally, disliked them, as I felt I wouldn't be able to say no, even if I wanted to. I feel like public proposals are okay when they've been specifically requested and agreed on, but one that's totally out of the blue is not okay at all. I assumed he was asking about this because his friend had just proposed to his girlfriend of several years, publicly, and she'd accepted, but admitted to him after that that she would have preferred something private. I never thought in a million years that he would propose. So you can imagine my shock when we went to dinner and the first thing he did was propose. The ring was huge, gold, gaudy, red gems around a diamond, and the whole thing was the size and shape of a Super Bowl ring. He got on one knee and held it out to me. We were in the middle of this popular restaurant and the place was packed. Everyone there could see what was going on and wasn't even trying to hide that they were looking at us. I said no. Well, I didn't so much say no, I ran out of the restaurant. He drove me there, so I got a cab back, and drove home that night. I realized running out wasn't the best thing to do, but I didn't know what else to do. I could feel everyone's eyes on me, and all I knew was that I didn't want to marry him or accept his proposal. I felt like I couldn't even speak, I was so upset about the whole thing. So I just got up and ran. I just want to take the opportunity to say here that I really, really don't care about the rings. Honestly, when I want to get married, which is absolutely not when I'm 19 years old, the right person could just turn to me and say, want to get married? And I'd say yes. I wouldn't even need a ring. I know I'm focusing on the ring and the public proposal a lot, but that's only because of one, how far away it was from what I'd told him my taste was, and two, what happened next. I didn't hear from him until a few weeks later. He said that he thought that a proposal was something that I'd want, but he saw now that it wasn't. He said that he was out of pocket for the rings. He'd bought us both the same one and gotten them engraved. He linked me to the jeweler's website and the ring was up for 1,450 euros. When I asked why he was telling me this, 
He said that he'd hoped that I would cover the cost of mine. He said that as they'd been engraved, he couldn't get a refund. He'd hoped that I would say yes to the proposal, in which case he wouldn't have asked me to pay, but I said no. He also said that I'd embarrassed him by saying no in public, and should have said yes, and if I was really against it, waited to say no when we were alone. We both live in small towns where gossip spreads at church. Enough people were at the restaurant that night that both of us got asked about it at church on Sunday. He has since messaged me saying he's debating calling in a lawyer to sue me for the cost of my ring. And he also says that I have caused him emotional distress by turning him down in public and have publicly humiliated him both for rejecting his proposal in public and leaving him to deal with church gossip, which I had no part in spreading. He says he can also get some money off of me over those other two things. So 1,450 euros for what he spent on my ring and extra money for emotional distress and public humiliation. I think his legal claims are all bullcrap and he wouldn't have a leg to stand on in a court of law, but I'm not a law student or a lawyer. He is studying law currently and has an internship at a legal firm. What do I do about all of this? Do I need to prepare myself for a lawsuit or is it not even worth worrying about? Thanks in advance. And now in the comments, he's using the fact that he's studying law to intimidate you into paying him. He thinks that you'll believe he has a legitimate claim since he knows the law better than you do. He does not have a legitimate claim. You can't sue someone for the cost of an engagement ring that they didn't accept. Had you said yes initially and then privately said no like he'd suggested, he may have had a semblance of a case, but you didn't. You are not on the hook because he can't read a room or understand your perspective on the relationship. Block him, ignore him, and go live your life without him. It sounds like it's so much better without him in it. And OP says, Okay, thank you. That's a huge relief to be honest. Can he sue me for emotional distress though? I don't think he can, but I'm going off the internet here. He can sue. He won't be successful at winning. If getting rejected was actionable for damages, I'd be a millionaire. He has as much of a claim as you do. He humiliated you in the restaurant and caused you distress with your church group. Anyone can sue for anything. Doesn't mean he'll get anywhere with it. My guess is he wouldn't even find a lawyer shady enough to take that case. Just make a clean break. He's toxic and you'll be better off without him. If he won't leave you alone, don't hesitate to get a restraining order. Also, Ireland has much more lenient protection orders than America, so don't be afraid to file for one if he makes you feel unsafe, okay? I've had to. I walked into court, everyone was lovely, even the judge. It was easily sorted. As long as the person that I filed against doesn't threaten or harass me, it has no impact on him, meaning it won't hurt him for you to file. And if he does threaten or attack me, the police will be able to come down hard. And now on to the update. He knew that I wanted to get married, but not to him. He not only knew this, but said that he had no intention of marrying me either. He openly despised marriage right up until the time that he proposed, and he knows that we want different things out of marriage. And I told him that this was why I was breaking up with him the times before this that I have ended the relationship. During the course of our relationship, he's also said stuff like, we're still too young to think about marriage. It's not like we're getting married. And my favorite, it's not like I'm gonna propose. That one was last April. Edit two, his mother has reached out to me apologizing for her son's actions. She has said that nothing will come of this and that she has raised an idiot. And now in the comments, sometimes I wish I had become a lawyer just to hear about the dumb crap people think that they can sue for. No need, small claims court is open to observers and some other trials too. I was in one the other day as a plaintiff, and there was another case where a guy was suing a girl for $5,000 because her five-month-old pug puppy bit him. His expenses were 20 bucks on Tylenol. She showed the picture of the puppy and everyone was like, aww. I went to small claims once to observe. One guy was suing his neighbor because the neighbor's cow got loose, ended up in the other neighbor's garden, and trampled and ate all his vegetables. 
The plaintiff was suing for $1,000 because he spent months cultivating his garden. Unfortunately, he only ended up getting a judgment for 10 bucks for the seeds because his labor wasn't worth anything in the eyes of the law. Pro tip, many courtrooms now have live streaming for the public because of COVID. For example, Orange County Superior Court has a page where you just click the courtroom and watch. My favorite pro per, aka no lawyer represented them, was a guy suing for a million thoughts and ideas stolen from him. When asked the dollar value, he said, you tell me, it's a million thoughts, you decide. I'm currently on a case where someone's mad at code enforcement because their neighbors didn't like their Trump signs in their yard. I still don't understand the thought process on that one, but the complaint has pictures pasted in it. Anyways, enjoy. Am I the asshole for distancing myself from my daughter after she took her mother's side? So I, 50 male, found out that my wife, 49 female, of 20 plus years, was having an affair. I was completely hurt over this and have started divorce proceedings. Obviously, this has been hard on our four children, but I cannot spend the rest of my life with someone that I can't trust. Before we got married, my wife's family had money and demanded that I sign a prenup. I had no problem with this, but since then, the family money has been lost due to bad investments and lawsuits. My wife was a stay-at-home mom for the majority of our marriage, our youngest child is 19, and because of the prenup, she can't get alimony. In short, my wife will be screwed. The only thing we owned together was our house, and while it's paid off, my wife won't be able to afford the upkeep or HOA fees, so she will effectively be homeless. I have no intention of giving her any type of support for any reason. Since serving my wife divorce papers, I have refused direct contact, as my lawyer has advised, but she's now playing dirty by getting the children involved. We have two boys, 23 and 21, and two girls, 25 and 19, and my wife has been pleading with them to get me to agree to hold the divorce proceedings in favor of counseling. After I told my children that I had no interest in wasting any more of my life with that woman, they have essentially backed off, except for my oldest, Christy. She's very close to her mother and can't imagine life where her parents aren't married. Christy tells me that her mother realizes her mistake and will do whatever it takes to make things right. She says that I owed it to the family to work things out. I refused and told her that it wasn't her place to make those kinds of demands. Since then, the only time Christy talks to me is when she's sobbing and asking me not to destroy the family. I understand that this is hard for her and offered to pay for therapy so she can cope, but she said there wouldn't be anything to cope with if I wasn't trying to divorce her mother. Since Christy is being too emotional to act within reason and refuse therapy, I've been resolved to limit contact until after the divorce. However, my other children are saying that Christy's behavior is getting worse. Am I the asshole for taking a step away from my daughter for a while? And now in the comments, not the asshole. You said this daughter is closest to your wife. Sounds like they are both manipulative and self-centered. Stay in contact with your daughter, but let her know that she has to respect your decision or else the conversation is over for today. I'm sorry for your pain. This must be very hard for you. However, taking joy from your wife's plight is not at all nice. OP, I am sorry that you are going through this, but you are no way the asshole in this case. I agree that you should distance yourself and continue with the divorce proceedings, and I hope you were able to again find happiness once this is all said and done. Huh, sir, is your wife still in the house, and how have things been? How are you and the kids holding up? And OP replies, yes, she is still in the house. I live in a condo, and until the divorce is finalized, or a judge says otherwise, I am voluntarily paying housing utilities directly. My wife is on her own for food, hygiene products, etc. I even took pictures of the house before serving her, so if any damages occur, my lawyer will fight back any argument that she has that she is not responsible for it. My youngest daughter spent Christmas with me, and I spoke to my son via video chat. I don't know what my oldest and ex-wife are doing, and have ignored their calls and text messages. I intend to wash my hands of my wife, and I am not talking to my daughter until the divorce is finalized at the very least. And now back up to the post, we have the update for more info. 
Alright, so I read a couple of responses, and I just wanted to clarify some things. One, clearly my, she will effectively be homeless comment was misinterpreted, so let me set the record straight. Because my wife and I own the house together, so long as we sell the house and split the proceedings, she'll get something. Two, my wife didn't give up her career to raise my children. We could have hired a nanny, but she didn't want that and chose to be a stay-at-home mom for our children, and because of her family money, she was getting a monthly allowance from the estate. Plus, I paid for a housekeeper to make things easier on her. Three, once my wife reached 30, she started getting a monthly allowance from the family estate, and the prenup addressed that, so I couldn't claim half. In exchange, she couldn't get alimony. Four, I didn't want my children to get involved in the divorce. My wife decided to do that, and even brought up the reason why as a form of a preemptive strike. I only talk about the divorce when someone else brings it up, which Christy wants to do all the time. Five, I am not abandoning my daughter. I am just lowering contact with her until the divorce is finalized because she's not letting up on trying to pressure me into taking her mother back and refuses to go to therapy that I will pay for. And six, also to the comments asking why my wife cheated, it's a little offensive. I don't know how that changes anything or that I should care. However, the guy that she cheated on me with was younger. Looked like he couldn't be any older than 30. So take that information and do what you will. And to the further update. I just wanted to say that I was very grateful for all of your kind words and support in how to deal with my daughter. I decided to follow some of your advice and have a scheduled sit down with her to explain that what goes on between her mother and I is not her fault and that I simply can't ever go back to a woman who deceived me in such a big way. I told her that I try to be as forgiving and empathetic as possible, but I will not ever tolerate people who lie to me with malicious and selfish intent, and try to cut them out of my personal life as much as possible. I was very calm when I said this, and tried to be as loving as I could to my child, but it didn't work. Christy ended up breaking down again, and tried to convince me not to divorce her mother and just forgive her. I refused, and in the end went no contact with Christy for a little bit. I only spoke to her again two days before my other daughter's Jane's birthday through a text asking her not to bring up the divorce since this was going to be the first time my wife and I would be in each other's presence since I filed. I sent the same text to her mother and I didn't hear anything from either of them. On Jane's birthday, things were a little tense and awkward, but I thought that it was going good until my wife decided to be passive aggressive with a speech about how good it is to have family together during important events. Everyone saw through her crap and my son Jack called her out on it and said that she was selfish to bring this up on Jane's birthday. Christy started defending her mother and Jane, understandably upset, revealed that the only reason Christy was on her mother's side for reconciliation was because she didn't want the fact that she not only knew about the affair, but helped her mother cover it up. There was a big fight that wasn't going to get resolved right then and there. I ended up leaving and was even more heartbroken all over again. Not only did my wife betray me, but my own daughter too? I knew she was more close to her mother than me and I was okay with that, but this? I don't know what I did to make my eldest daughter so disloyal to me, but I am now resolved to go full no contact with her until after the divorce and possibly for the rest of my life. And now in the comments, I told my dad about my mum's affair partner when I was four and got yelled at by both of them for making up stories. When I was 20, my mum finally acknowledged that I hadn't been lying. How did your father react then? He found out about a year after I told him and forgave him. He has low self-esteem and I bet he blamed himself for not being good enough. Then our family moved to a small town far from where her affair partner was. I just feel bad for Jane having her birthday be made about her parents' divorce and her sister's involvement with it. It is not worth it to force family togetherness when there is bad blood between some of the family members. It may hurt to have two separate birthday celebrations, but it hurts way less than having a single drama-filled one. Damn, this reminds me of my father-in-law. In his previous marriage, he and his ex-wife had three sons together. He found out his wife cheated and his three sons knew. He divorced her and just cut them all out of his life. He remarried and they had my husband. 
I've asked my husband his brother's names, and he has no clue because his dad refuses to speak of his past. Did the oldest three sons at least try to make amends? Not that I'm aware of. I do know that we ran into one of the sons at a family reunion party on my father-in-law's side, and my father did not acknowledge him. However, the daughter-in-law somehow got the father-in-law's address and stopped by on Halloween to try to introduce her children to a father-in-law, the kid's grandfather. He again refused to meet them, but my mother-in-law felt bad and talked to them for a bit. Our next post is titled, I asked my boyfriend to reply to a message for me and he started looking through my phone. So the other day I was baking and my boyfriend came into the kitchen to hang out with me for a bit. So we're talking and laughing, and at this point, I was basically elbow deep in flour. So when I got a text, I asked him to look at it and reply to it for me. It wasn't anything bad, just my friend asking if I was home and if she could come over. I told him to text her yes she could, and after he did that, he started looking through my phone. When I asked him what he was doing, he said, I'm looking through your chats, it's no big deal. Um, sir, this is not how this works, lol. I just felt annoyed that he would use that opportunity to look through my phone, so I asked him why. He said he just wanted to see what I was up to. Now, I don't have anything to hide, but the reply angered me and made me think that he didn't trust me. Also, the way he went about it was a little irritating because I asked him to do something and he took advantage of that opportunity. Would you rather I do it secretly? He asked. Well, no. In fact, I'd rather he didn't do it at all. Of course, here comes the, if you didn't have anything to hide, then you wouldn't be irate right now, which pissed me off even more. I'm literally kneading furiously at this point and asking him repeatedly to please drop my phone. He refused and went to our bedroom and locked himself in there. I'm not one to do too much. And also, I had nothing to hide, so I waited for him to come back from his little expedition and come and answer me when he doesn't find anything. It was about 20 minutes when he came back in with a goofy smile and dropped the phone back on the counter. I asked him if he found anything and he said no, that maybe I'm just good at hiding with that same crap eating grin. At this point, I am boiling and asked him how he felt invading my privacy and he said that my privacy is his privacy. I tried to explain that I didn't like how he went about it and I don't like that behavior at all but he was countering, saying that if I wasn't cheating or being dubious, then this shouldn't be a big deal. That if I wanted to look through his phone too, I'm welcome. I just silently walked away and have been seething for two days. He tried to apologize, but he still doubles down on the fact that if I had nothing to hide, I wouldn't be pissed. But I didn't, like FFS. I just don't like my privacy invaded like that. Like, what is so hard to understand? I'm hurt and frustrated because it's the principle that matters. I won't be out here looking through his phone, and if I wanted to, I would just ask. And it's the same here too. If he had just asked, I'd have let him. He is an amazing, sweet man to me, and I love him with all my heart. But he gets jealous sometimes, and when I react to it, he tries to push it off like it's no big deal. He says he trusts me, and that he just felt like seeing what I've been up to. Am I looking for chest on an ant here? Sorry, HW reference couldn't help myself, but I feel like I'm going crazy. What can I do? And now in the comments, he basically said you were cheating, and he just hasn't caught you yet. And if you ever prohibit him from searching your phone or whatever, you're admitting to cheating. His comments and actions led me to believe that he is projecting. Be careful, OP. He says he trusts me, and I'm the Queen of England. Kneel, please. He doesn't trust you. On top of that, his method of communicating sounds utterly frustrating. Running away to lock himself in the bedroom with your phone is the behavior of a child who grabbed a cookie and wants to gobble it down before it gets taken away. Him saying that your privacy is his privacy is concerning on multiple levels, as it indicates that he doesn't see you as a separate person with autonomy that he doesn't have control over. What can you do? Well, you can sit him down and tell him once that this can never happen again and that he needs to demonstrate that he understands that it was wrong. Or you can dump him because this entire story is riddled with red flags. Yes, 
The running away to a room thing had me furious for OP. It's bad enough he started browsing, but at least if he backed off when OP got mad, it could be forgivable. But this little douchebag locks himself in a room to keep snooping for 20 minutes and then doesn't apologize after? Throw the whole man in the trash, OP. Completely disrespectful. He crossed boundaries and on top of it, basically claimed you as a possession by saying your privacy is his privacy. WTF does that even mean? Red flag of what's to come. You're young, walk away. And OP says, for real, like, what does that crap even mean? Are we in the stone ages or something? I'm honestly so turned off by him. And now back up to the post, we have an edit. I'll be speaking to him tonight and laying down clear ground rules. Might have to make an ultimatum if all else fails. We'll update with what happens. I'm really scared and sad, and I feel betrayed. Been with him for a year and a half, and this is the most hurt I've ever felt by him. I will break up with him if it comes down to it, because above all else, I prioritize myself and my mental health. And now on to the update. Firstly, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. The responses I got here were so eye-opening. Things I never thought of before. I realized that his jealousy wasn't normal. Me being able to handle him when he gets like that was me literally getting used to his cycle of abuse. I had told a commenter that he was cheated on really, really badly by his ex. People were asking if this was true, and it was. I was the person he came to when it was crashing down, and he has receipts, so I never thought that he was lying. We didn't get together until a year after they broke up though, because in that time we had gotten closer and I felt really bad for him. I feel like being with him while he healed was not a good idea, or crutch after the fact, especially as I had been so involved with him as sort of an emotional crutch after the fact of his breakup. One way he found out about his ex cheating was by testing her. This should have been a red flag. I, however, told him later in our relationship that he should do nothing of the sort. I won't tolerate it. On the day that I posted, I went to meet up with my friend that's sort of a tech whiz. Interestingly, she's the same friend that I asked him to reply to. She combed through my phone, laptop, and iPad, and confirmed there were no bugs or anything cloning or spying through my devices. That was a relief. When I got back home, he had made dinner for us, got me my favorite snacks, and really wanted to talk. I was receptive to him and really thought that he had thought about his actions and was ready to apologize properly. Boy, was I wrong. He admitted that he was testing me, playing manipulative mind games with me, and he thought that if he made me scared about finding something out, I would break down and confess. When I didn't, and he didn't find anything on my phone, he started feeling guilty. I asked him why he didn't just come to me if he was having suspicions, and he said that that would have just given me an opportunity to lie, and that the way he went about it was a surefire way for me not to have any time to cover my tracks. What an asshole. So why did he keep doubling down? Man, you're gonna have to ask him. He just said that the guilt made him do stupid things, but I didn't believe that. I asked him outright if he was cheating on me. He said no. Taking advice from y'all, I asked him for his phone so I could look through it, and I did. He sat there with his leg rattling under the table. I think it was nerves. Another red flag to me. I think he deleted some messages because his boys group chat that I know for a fact he always spoke in was not there. And there were gaps in a conversation with a girl that he knows that I don't like because she had been texting him earlier in our relationship and he had told me not to worry about her. The messages that were there were just regular conversations with the occasional trauma dumping from her and vice versa. Things that I thought he could only feel comfortable telling me. When I asked about this, he denied having anything scandalous to do with her. That she was a close friend, and if he told me about him talking to her, he knew that I'd freak out and break up with him. I just didn't believe him. I had such a nagging feeling. I didn't want to see any more, so I just dropped the phone, and my heart was breaking and breaking and breaking. He showed me that he had booked a flight to Bali for a couple's trip to show me how sorry he was. I was stunned because how could I find something booky on your phone and you confess to testing me and you're still trying to do damage control? 
Funnily enough, in my head, I was imagining scenarios of him taking my passport and leaving me stranded if something happened that he didn't like. I then started realizing that if I can think that he could do something so heinous, he probably would. I told him that he hurt me badly because of his insecurities, and he crossed a huge line by infringing on my privacy in such a way, not hearing my no, and I didn't think that I could continue being with him from that point on. I told him that even if I had nothing to hide, what about the privacy of my friends and the trust they had in me for their issues to not leave my own eyes? Why did he feel okay jeopardizing that for his own fruitless gain? He said that he wasn't thinking about that and just begged and pleaded and said how he didn't want to lose me, but it made me sick to my stomach how he felt so comfortable manipulating me. I told him that he has to work on himself because I'm done trying to navigate his possessiveness and insecurity. And after that, I said he could stay the night on the couch, but I'd like for him to move out tomorrow. He tried to beg and plead some more, but I am not hearing it. I didn't even have to do an ultimatum because I just wasn't interested in continuing this anymore. How do you claim to love somebody but, at every turn, question their motives with everybody? Especially when I had never given him a reason to. It got way worse because this morning, he confessed. I guess as a last ditch effort to show me transparency, the irony, that he cheated with the girl once in the early stages of our relationship and that was the guilt that was eating at him. He tried to lock himself in the bathroom, which was another one of his manipulative tactics that I realized he liked to do when something didn't go his way, lock himself in a room until I conceded, but I told him that I'd call the police. I have never said that before, and I guess he realized that I was serious, so he came out and took some things and went to his brother's. I'm heartbroken, I'm hurt, and I feel like I have lost a part of me. I feel like my whole relationship was a power trip filled with control and lies. I used to see myself as strong, but thinking back at our relationship, I've realized the many things I endured just because I felt I was handling it. One thing though, I am glad that I came here. You helped me realize that this could have gotten worse and my life could have been in danger later down the line. If not that, that I'd have been filled with more pain and regret later had this come up or if I allowed this to continue. So yeah, that's where we're at now. I'm gonna post his crap to his brother's house and as for those tickets, I'm gonna try to see if I can use them and go with my tech friend as a thank you so we could go for a vacation or try to travel, you know, dancing at a club around there or something. Just try to keep my mind off it, I guess. Thank you guys so much again. If you have any questions, please ask and I'll try my best to answer. And now in those comments, if he bought those tickets using your money, do as you wish. Refund them or go somewhere with your friend or raise hell to the police, you know, anything you want. If he bought those tickets with his money, return it to him. No, do not keep it. Do not give him a way to squiggle back into your life. Don't let him use it as an excuse or leverage. Please throw it back to him. It is bad news to use it. And OP says, it's the least I deserve. I'm gonna go on that trip and he can suck my dick. Every time I was ever accused of hiding things and or cheating, it turns out the other person was hiding things and or cheating. I've only been accused once and sure enough, he was cheating the whole relationship. Gee, sounds like my ex-fiance. I worked at a call center for roadside assistance when we were together and it was one of those ones where you don't get to clock out and leave when your shift ends. You leave when you've finished with the last call you took before your shift ended because we weren't supposed to leave anybody stranded. Some days it was a few minutes to finish up, sometimes half an hour, and on a few occasions, it took hours to close out the call. I'd get accused of cheating with the security guys that sat at the door checking people in and out. I'd get accused of not even loving him or being good enough to be called a girlfriend, let alone fiance. I was so beat down with work and life that I was going to the crisis center to get help with my mental health and medication. I didn't give a crap about sex because I was too busy trying to find the will to live. More cheating accusations because I was getting it somewhere if I wasn't doing it with him. We stayed together after I went on meds and got help. Found out later that he cheated through the entire four and a half year relationship and it was with both sexes, putting me at risk because I don't know if he was practicing safely. I know that everyone on this sub knows this already, but just in case anyone doesn't, you can still have your own privacy in a relationship. 
You do not have to share every single thing about yourself, your past, anything with anyone if you do not feel comfortable. You also do not need to show your phone to your partner, nor let them read through it. Boundaries in a relationship exist for a reason, and just because one person feels comfortable sharing something doesn't mean everyone does. Also to add, there is a difference between using your partner's phone and going through every single message. Just because you're okay with the former doesn't mean you consent to the latter. Am I the asshole for getting my eldest daughter a kitten when my wife is already overwhelmed with our disabled child? So my eldest NT daughter has had to make so many sacrifices for her sister with nonverbal autism. More sacrifices than any child should have to make. She has unintentionally been put on the back burner ever since her younger sister was born. It is clearly taking a toll on her, and I feel really bad. The poor child cannot even have playdates unless I'm there, because my wife cannot manage another child alone, on top of our two because our daughter with autism needs constant supervision, can be aggressive, and is very prone to meltdowns. She cannot even go to friends' houses unless I'm there to help, unless the other parent can drive her and bring her back, because our daughter with autism is too difficult to handle in cars without another adult there. She has also been subject to aggressive behaviors from her sister, and has always been expected to let her sister have the first turn, the biggest piece, and the winning ticket, so to speak. She has also had her toys frequently destroyed by her sister. I partly blame myself for this, and I'm trying to do better by her. She has been dying for a kitten ever since she could speak, but my wife kept saying no because she couldn't handle any more work, as our autistic daughter requires so much care. I see the longing look on my daughter's eyes whenever there's a kitten on the television, in a magazine, etc., and I've always tried to get easy pets like a betta fish so that my wife wouldn't be overwhelmed, but she still wants a kitten. My wife is a stay-at-home mom, and I work long hours. I thought my daughter has had it rough these past five years, and for once, deserved a little joy in her life. So I decided against my wife's wishes to get her a kitten. The joy on her face ever since having her kitten brought tears to my eyes, and I'm not a crier. My wife is furious with me, and has demanded that I return the kitten. Our daughter cried so much over hearing this. I have usually acquiesced to her, but this time I put my foot down and said absolutely not. I understand she's overwhelmed, but our daughter deserves a little bit of joy in her life for once, and as she gets older, she'll be able to handle the kitten more. Our daughter is a person, and not just supposed to be a decorative artifact in her sister's story. I understand she's the one who's home, and has to help take care of it much of the time, but it will not be a kitten forever, and it'll grow into a more independent cat. At least our daughter was asking for a kitten rather than a puppy, which is a lot more work. I've seen a lot of posts on here about adult children of disabled siblings going no contact with their parents due to emotional neglect, and I'm trying to prevent that from happening. Am I the asshole? OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. Parents are supposed to put on a united front, and my wife feels I disrespected her wishes, and because I work a lot, she will be stuck with the grunt of the work. And now in the comments, info, who's going to stop the aggressive toy-breaking child from hurting the kitten? Exactly. She is a stay-at-home mom and truly knows her daughter's day-to-day -day lives. She knows what she can handle, and blocking the kitten from her other daughter is going to be a handful. Not only this, but there are ways to socialize and curb this kind of behavior in autistic children. While the kid is only five, it almost sounds like they are being enabled without much attempt at teaching consequences. Obviously, we don't know the whole life story, but that's what I gather. Things like that lead to things like Chris Chan happening. <laughs> hey, we didn't need to go there. Did not need to say that one. Oh my god. If you don't know about Chris Chan, it's probably for the best you stay out of that one. More info. What are you doing to prevent your daughter feeling emotionally neglected aside from buying her a kitten? Are you spending time with her, taking her places and doing things she enjoys? Are you stepping up to look after your autistic daughter so that your wife can have a break and can also bond with your older daughter? Are you involving an extended support network in your lives so both you and your wife can enjoy family time with both your children? Or did you just buy her a kitten for your wife to stress about so you could pat yourself on the back for not emotionally neglecting your child? 
100% this is the comment. What else are you trying for her? She can't go on playdates because your wife can't drive her? Explain your situation and ask if the friend's parents can give her a ride. Set aside time with her regularly, one-on-one, -on -one, or give your wife a chance to spend that time with her. If you and your wife agreed to get the kitten, there would be no problems, but she's going to have to care for and protect it on top of everything else now, and you can't take it away without breaking your daughter's heart. You've put your wife between a rock and a hard place and made your daughter feel responsible for a fight, and for that, you're the asshole. What are you going to do to keep this cat alive? You'd better devote yourself to it and your daughter to a new level if you want to fix this disaster that you've created. Quote, the poor child cannot even go on playdates unless I'm there, then effing be there. You're the asshole for going against your wife's expressed wishes. And OP replies, whenever I'm not at work, I am at home. I have completely given up any semblance of a social life or any personal time so I can be there for my kids and my wife. I am the sole breadwinner, I am the only one bringing in an income, I go to work the bare minimum that I have to to keep this family afloat. You have a medical home option for your daughter. She's not always going to be small enough to manage her. She needs to be homed with professionals, people who know how to let her grow and have goals and to live her best life. Sounds like your family is on 100% defense. Is there a group home she can go to during the day or on weekends? You can't do this for the next 30 years. Start looking now for a secondary home for her. Start now getting her used to not living full time at your home. Believe me, it's for the best, for her and your family. Edit, thank you everyone for the awards. And to be clear, we as a society must begin to recognize the benefit of reaching out to professionals to provide extraordinary support to our loved ones with these types of challenges. We have to normalize seeking mental health care. Just as a broken leg requires a cast and sometimes surgery, mental health challenges require medical treatment too. Mental health care is medical care. Gone are the days that parents can keep a child in their home isolated from the world, while those same parents drive themselves into a depression trying to manage a child that needs professional help. This child needs immediate care, whether it's daily care during the day or overnight care in a home specifically created to guide autistic children to adulthood. And to those commenting the parents shouldn't dump their daughter in a facility, you have no idea what you're talking about and are 100 years in the past. Today's medical professionals recognize the benefits of creating goals and boundaries for children with autism that offers these children the best opportunity to live their best life as adults. And now on to the update. My wife and I are now separated and more likely than not getting a divorce. I have tried everything and my wife has refused all suggestions. She refuses respite care because our daughter with autism doesn't like strangers, said the same thing when I offered to hire a pet sitter for the kitten for when I'm not home to help. I spoke to an old acquaintance of mine from college who is now a child psychologist because I was at my wits end. He said, I'm going to be very candid with you. Children with high needs autism such as yours will only get bigger, stronger and worse. Yes, she may currently be helped by ABA therapy and such, but all that help and training will go out the window once she hits puberty. And in every single case, their siblings have ended up with psychological issues, depression, anxiety, and CPTSD, and then often go low or no contact with parents upon adulthood. And telling your child that I'm doing the best I can and don't take it personal will not reduce the harmful impact on their mental and emotional health. My advice, get her into a group home ASAP. I'm not saying forget about her or don't be in her life. I'm saying that is where they all end up eventually and you'll be doing no one any favors by waiting until she's too large and strong for you and your wife to manage. I have not seen one case of behavior improving for the long term until they ended up in a group home. I'm sorry to have to be so grim, but I couldn't bring myself to lie to you. It is no one's fault. It is the nature of high needs, low functioning autism. All the love in the world won't fix it. I thanked him for his honesty. I discussed it with my wife, including the group home, and she'll have none of it. A minute later, I hear a tumble and two loud cries. Older daughter is at the bottom of the steps. Younger one is at the top. She cried, she pushed me. 
All her mother could say was, if you had picked up your toys like I told you to, this wouldn't have happened. She stepped on your toy and got upset, that's why she pushed you. This was the final straw for me. I said, for the love of God, what's wrong with you? She's seven years old. Neither of us can handle her, and you expect a seven-year-old to? She yelled at me to get out. So I told her, way ahead of you. I want a divorce, and I'm taking the oldest daughter and kitten with me. I then took daughter to the hospital to get her checked out for internal injuries. She has a few scrapes, but is otherwise okay. Physically, at least. Wife never called to ask if she was okay. She and I are staying in a hotel with a kitten until I find us an apartment. We've only been here three days, and I already see such a difference in daughter. She's not the shell of a child that I once knew. She's happy, vibrant, calmer than I've ever seen her, and hasn't cried once. While she used to cry one to two times a day before. I do plan to get her therapy ASAP, which her mother wouldn't let her do, claiming no time. But when I offered for her to do Zoom sessions with therapist, she said no, because she doesn't want the therapist judging her. And on top of that, she absolutely adores her kitten. She stays with my parents while I'm working, and I plan to send more than ample child support and alimony to my wife and other daughter and let them have the house. I did what I had to do for her well-being. The child psychologist I spoke with said that I'm the first person he's seen who advocates this much for the well child, and that broke my heart. Thank you again, everyone. And now in the comments, oh, F. This is absolutely heartbreaking for all involved. I think it's absolutely for the best, but still. I do hope the dad advocates hard for a professional, in addition to the mum to be regularly, weekly at minimum, involved with the autistic child's care. From what I can see, mum is only catering to the autistic child's meltdowns and not preparing the autistic child for the world. I get it. I am fairly certain that in her shoes, I would probably also be doing anything I could to avoid another meltdown, and I would probably be extremely resistant to asking for any help. I also acknowledge that forcing autistic kids to behave like neurotypical kids is very harmful to them. All that said, strangers are a fact of life, and autistic kid needs to learn to cope. They will not learn to cope if you make sure they never encounter a stranger ever. The best stranger, or strangers, to learn to cope with are ones who are knowledgeable about and experienced with autism. Also, as far as I can see, the autistic kid was not even told that they were wrong for pushing the sister down the stairs. The sister was told she was wrong for making the autistic kid do it by not picking up her toys. But the mother didn't seem to make any attempt to teach the autistic kid better behavior, and that is likely to be a huge problem in a few years. I am that parent who had to make that awful choice to allow my non-verbal autistic son, then eight, to be placed in a residential home with specially trained staff. It broke my heart, but I knew I had done all I could for him at home. I had almost nothing left over for my other children because I couldn't even go to the bathroom without fearing he would get into danger. ETA, the sleep deprivation due to having to supervise him at night, as he slept only four to five hours or not at all, was horrendous. He is almost 22 and thriving. I work in both private home care and residential homes. You absolutely made the right choice. The people that suffer the most in these situations are the family members. I am trained, paid well, and get to go home and relax after my shift. The parents and guardians generally are untrained, rarely receive more than a pittance in financial support from the government, and are essentially on call 24-7. It's a hard choice to make, but I've seen too many people and families be ruined by running themselves ragged trying to care for someone like that. Don't set yourself on fire to keep someone else warm. And that's the big reason why they get much better care. The caregivers in the home get to go home and leave that work behind, and the next shift comes in fresh. At home, there is no break, there is no vacation, very little sleep. So the caregiver is not giving nearly as good care as they think they are because there is so very little left in the gas tank. They think that their love will make up for it, but it doesn't. Our next post is titled, My fiancé says that I am not American, despite being born and raised here. We've been together for three years, and are supposed to be getting married in December. 
To start off, my family is from India. My parents were born and raised in India. Me, my brother and my sister were all born here in the US and raised here. I have only visited India once when I was about 10 to meet my extended family and grandparents and I haven't been back since. I can't even speak a word of Punjabi. I was very grateful that my parents were more integrating than other Indian families I knew growing up. My mother would make traditional Indian food, but she would also mix it up a lot and make mac and cheese or burgers, chicken or imitation beef, though she didn't mind if we bought McDonald's outside of the house. My parents encouraged us to join sports and do other extracurriculars that would let us bond with the kids who went to our school rather than just hang out with the Indian kids from other Indian families just because they were Indian. My dad always said that he saw so many people get stuck in their ways because they never ventured out of what was familiar to them. So fast forward to three years ago, I met my fiance, Alan. What I liked about him was he didn't make it a point that we were this exotic interracial couple. He didn't treat me differently than anyone else. And we of course talked about my family and he knew that my parents were from India, but that me and my siblings had grown up here. He never said anything that came off ignorant, which was very refreshing considering how every guy I had dated before that had had some weird Indian chick fetish that gradually came out during the relationship. He proposed six months ago. Until about a month ago, things were going well and we were planning our wedding that we decided to have in December. He asked me if we were going to have an American or Indian wedding or both. And I replied that we were just going to have an American wedding because I really didn't know anything about an Indian one and my family really isn't traditional like that so they weren't fussed. Alan seemed surprised and when I asked why he said, well I mean, you're Indian. I just thought that we were going to also celebrate accordingly. I then asked him jokingly if we were going to have beer steins and if he was going to wear lederhosen at our wedding. He gave me a completely baffled look and said no. And I said, well, it's the same sentiment really. You and I were both raised here, we were both American. To which he said, yeah, but well, not really. You're Indian American. It turned into an argument where I challenged him and asked him why he's not calling himself German American or Irish American, since that's where his grandparents hail from. And he never once gave me a solid answer. Everything was vague and a lot of blubbering began to happen the more that I asked him why he could just be an American but I needed a clarification of a hyphen in there. We never resolved the issue. We just ended up sweeping it under the rug and didn't talk about it again until this week. At dinner with his parents, the issue of an Indian wedding came up again. I politely told them no, that we wouldn't be doing that as my parents aren't traditional and that is the only reason that I would be having an Indian wedding. Alan pipes up and says it's a shame because you Indians do weddings way better than us Americans, nodding towards his mum and dad. I asked him right there and then what he meant because I was also an American. And he said, well, you know what I mean. Like, you're Indian and we're white. It left a really sour taste in my mouth. And then I got to thinking about what happens after we get married and decide to have kids. Kids born here in America. Are we going to have to deal with their dad continually reminding them that because they're a bit more brown, that they're not really American? I know people will say some ignorant things because woohoo for racism, but I don't want the first instance of prejudice to come from their own father. I don't want my kids to feel the way I do when someone insists on slapping the Indian American label on me because I look one way and talk and act another. This is honestly making me rethink the wedding, but I don't know if I'm overreacting here or if my feelings are valid. I don't even know how to really approach my fiance about this whole issue without coming off bitter or angry. I'm not saying that I don't know what my heritage is, but the fact is, I was raised here. My ties to India are purely because my parents happen to be born there. I don't want to have to straddle two worlds because I'm not even really part of one, and I don't want my kids to feel that way either. And now in the comments, he doesn't seem to understand the difference between race and nationality. I would have a serious conversation with him about this, but given the relationship has been good up until now, give him some benefit of the doubt. You are 100% American, but you're not a white American. It seems like he might have been trying to respectfully acknowledge the racial difference and he screwed up. He phrased it badly by implying that you're not just American, and he also wrongly assumed that you want to take part in traditional Indian customs. 
But think about it from his point of view. Wouldn't he also risk hurting you by denying any possible difference, insisting on Anglo-American customs without asking your preferences, and sweeping your Indianness under the rug? Even though he knows Indian culture is not important to you, he might wonder if you want to acknowledge that background on such an important day as your wedding. There is a fine line to tread. I think his intentions were in the right place. Talk to him. I think he just doesn't understand the nuances of race versus ethnicity, versus nationality, versus culture, but that is something that OP can educate him on. Racially, she's Asian or Asian Indian, whatever she chooses to identify as. Ethnically, she is Indian, her nationality is American due to her birthright citizenship, and India not recognizing dual citizenship. Culturally, she seems to identify as American, perhaps with mild Indian influences. He is ignorant, but I wouldn't outright label him racist unless he is willfully and deliberately resistant to our attempts to explain why his views on the matter are flawed and personally offensive to her. This sounds like a sitcom. I'm not saying you're fabricating it, just that it sounds like one of those sitcom situations where the husband stereotype says something dumb and ignorant, not out of maliciousness, but because he's dumb and ignorant. Sounds like he's perceiving the difference because of the stereotypes, but it doesn't sound like he's meaning any harm or offense. He's just kind of an idiot about this from the sound of it. I'd start by sitting him down and having a serious discussion, starting with his potential attitude towards any future children. Focus on calmly educating him and see if he can come around. And OP replies, No, trust me, I completely understand. I was waiting for some punchline joke to be told during dinner and the canned laughter to play. I'm gonna do my best and just sit down with him and try to explain it the way that I did in my post. In fact, maybe it would be good to show him the post entirely, and some of the responses here as well. And now, on to the update. First, wow! Did not expect this post to get so much attention. I originally planned to reply to all the comments, but there's like 500 on that post now. So, gonna be that person and say a general thank you to everyone who took the time to reach out and weigh in. I read all your comments and messages, and I decided to talk to Alan. So I texted him before he got done with work and asked him if he had any plans after, and if not, I'd like to talk to him about something. He said that he'd come straight home. He got home and we sat down to talk. I opened with saying that I loved him very much and that he was so different from anyone I'd ever met and let him know how much he means to me. I then said, but, and brought up what happened at his parents' dinner. Like many of you suggested, I made it clear to him why it was hurtful and ignorant. I told him that in all our time together, he has never made me feel other, and therefore it was a pretty bad shock to hear him say what he said. I told him that it's hard for a lot of other people to be minorities in this country, because you always have other people expecting you to play the cultural-bound immigrant even if you just aren't interested. For me personally, I just prefer not to have to have one foot in two different worlds. I grew up here, and that's all I really identify with. The fact that because I look the way I do, or have the last name that I do, people expect me to be more than I am in regards to India. It is very frustrating when it's a damned if you do, or damned if you don't situation. Even in the thread, I had people saying that I'm ashamed of being of Indian descent because I don't freaking care about all the cultural ties to it. To that I say, hey, did you think Alan was ashamed of being German-Irish because he's not calling himself German-Irish American or keeping any norms alive from those cultures? So once again, it falls on me to have to play this part that I have no effing interest in playing. So stop shoving this idea that people are married to their ancestors' culture down people's throats because it creates yet another barrier when it comes to integration. And then I showed him the thread. By the time he got done reading everything, comments included, he looked mortified. He apologized for the way that he treated me during dinner, and he admitted to me that his views had been ignorant. We had a long discussion about norms and attitudes that he grew up with, and as many of you noted, Alan grew up with white being the default for American. He said he never had thought about how Caucasians get a free pass when it comes to being American but someone with different features is immediately considered an other and needs a hyphen. I apologized to him for not explicitly spelling it out, but I told him that I assumed in this day and age that it would be a little more obvious to him. 
We talked about future children, and we both agreed to have them grow up American, and if later they chose to connect with other roots, then that was fine too. He said that he never wanted to make our kids feel like he made me feel with those comments. And no, he didn't want the whole Bollywood wedding some people thought he wanted. He was just making sure that I knew that I had that choice, but now he has promised not to bring it up again, and we finally laid that issue to rest. I also told him, albeit a bit more jokingly, that I wouldn't be making him any ruddy so he can stop holding his breath, that I'd become some Indian housewife. We both agreed that this is probably not the last conversation we will have about race, but we also agreed that we wouldn't let it go under the rug again. He said he won't be hyphenating anyone else from now on, and instead, let them set that identity for themselves. I appreciated that a lot, and I could actually see that he took it seriously, and that he wasn't just saying whatever I wanted to hear. So the wedding is still on. Yay. Really, thank you guys so much. It was good to feel validated in this. It made me want to actually approach the issue instead of ducking my head and ignoring it. If I didn't know about this sub, I would have probably kept it bottled and so much resentment would have accumulated before I finally exploded like a firework on the 4th of July. And now in the comments, that whole thing about the German-Irish American, this is so insightful, and I'm amazed that in the context of a question regarding unintentional racism, you again had to deal with additional unintentional racism. Very illuminating to see such concrete proof of its omnipresence. It is interesting for sure. I'm first generation Chinese Canadian since my childhood, while my boyfriend's grandparents are all Dutch. He grew up in a Dutch Christian neighborhood, was even forced to be at a private school of that background. His family speak a few words of Dutch as jokes sometimes, though he doesn't identify as Dutch Canadian, which I guess makes sense since he's third generation and doesn't even like much of the culture. To be honest, sometimes I hyphenate him just because it's normal for me, coming from a place with a lot of newish immigrants. But I agree with OP that we should not just assume and let people identify themselves. There are times people assume I'm born in Canada by my looks, and there are times people assume that I'm Chinese and need proof for my English just because of my last name. Hell, there are times people in Europe assume that I'm American. The horror. I'm usually not offended because I understand everyone carries preconceptions, but I've also learned to just take the answer for where are you from at face value and not pry or assume further. I'm so happy with how your fiancé reacted and that it all worked out for you. This post really is close to my heart as I'm also a minority in a Western culture, albeit British instead of American. I even had someone repeatedly asking for my real Asian name because he didn't believe that my Western sounding name was my birth name. This is a really interesting thread. I never considered that the hyphenation, as it were, could be slapping a label on someone they didn't want, only that it represented extra cultural identity that I didn't have. Also, props for having a conversation like adults. Yeah, this was a weird one for me, because I proudly display my hyphenation. I'm 100% Chinese and 100% American, and screw anyone who thinks I have to choose. Some well-meaning folks think that being called a hyphenated American somehow makes me less American, but hell no. It just means I embrace my heritage and the society that I grew up in. Now that I've written all that out, I can actually see where OP is coming from. Having people assume and pigeonhole you into something you aren't is insanely annoying. Am I the asshole for saying that a special education teacher shouldn't be around children? So after my family relocated when I was about 12 years old, I started at an all-girls school and tried my best to make friends. Fortunately, I met some wonderful people who I am still friends with today, but Tash, who's about the same age, made my life a living hell. She bullied and belittled me until I was forced to change schools again, and she would frequently gloat to our mutual friends that the school had been her turf. After changing schools, I, now female 29, carried on with my life. I attended university, met and married my now husband, and have a wonderful daughter, female 5. My last interaction with Tash was when we ran into each other at a mutual friend's birthday party, and she started playing her old games again. I was pregnant with my daughter at the time, and she told me that there was no place for fat people at such a fancy restaurant. I did not talk to her after that. 
I sat at the other end of the table and enjoyed the evening. Recently, my daughter's pediatrician has begun noticing some delays and has recommended a local special education program. He believes that it is mostly due to a lack of socialization over the last few years, but would like us to work with specialists now so that the delays do not become more serious. My husband and I went down to have a chat to the headmaster the other day, and my daughter has been admitted. Unfortunately, when we went to have a look at the classroom and meet the teacher, it was none other than Tash. In the moment, I thought that there was a possibility we could be both adults and move past what happened in our childhood and at my friend's birthday party. But the first words out of Tash's mouth were, thank goodness you did something to your hair. Remember how awful you always looked? My husband and I walked out the door and straight into the headmaster's office where I requested that my daughter be placed in any other class. Of course, I was asked why, and I said that Tash had bullied me while we were children, had just insulted me again, and I did not want my daughter exposed to her. We were both assured that there was a place for my daughter in the program, and that Tash would not come into any contact with her. Through the grapevine, I have now heard that Tash has lost her job, and has been complaining to everyone who will listen that I have ruined her career and her only shot at life. I thought that it was odd that she had lost her job over this one incident, but apparently a number of parents had already complained. I mentioned to some school friends that I did not think that a woman like Tash should be around children, especially children who need a little bit of extra support and love. The ladies that I was chatting to jumped down my throat, saying that I am ruining Tash's reputation and am now bullying her. I don't think that you're bullying her. I think that these people are twisting the situation. Perhaps Tash got to them first. But from where I'm sitting, it seems like Tash is the entire problem. I don't see how they can be on Tash's side if you had told them all of this, plus her comments like, remember how awful you always looked? I don't know, the only way that I could justify that is that Tash has got to everyone before this and told them a twisted version of events. I don't think you're the asshole for getting her fired. I think she deserved it and she had it coming. I'm gonna say not the asshole. Tash is. Now in the comments, I literally laughed out loud. You're ruining her reputation? No, she did that to herself by being a bully. How are grown women still bullying? She needs some serious help to work on herself. Huge, not the asshole. I had a teacher when I was in freshman in high school that made my life a living hell. It got to the point that people reached out to one of my siblings that had already graduated. She told my mum what was going on and she got in touch with the school. Once the teacher figured out what was going on, she called my mum at her job to tell her how much she loved me, etc, etc. After the investigation was concluded, her teaching credentials were permanently revoked in our state. You absolutely did the right thing. You kept your kid out of a bad situation. I had a teacher in my senior year that made me cry almost every day. It was so bad that the other students were apologizing to me after class because it was so clearly targeted. We would check our quizzes against each other's to see that she had graded me way harder than everyone else. Right answers, wrong steps kind of deal. Unfortunately, the school basically told us that they knew that she was a problem, but couldn't do anything about it because she was tenured. I had a counselor nice enough to give me a stack of blank appointment notes with her signature so I could write in a time and date and leave whenever I needed. You didn't bully her. You factually reported what she did. Apparently, she's been throwing that kind of toxic bully rhetoric around enough that who knows how many other families have complained about her. Not the asshole, and get rid of those friends who chose to overlook and diminish the extent of her behavior for decades. And like, jobs don't fire people at the first non-criminal, minor, offense, or they risk lawsuits. This was not her first complaint, although it probably was her last. Not the asshole. You didn't ruin her life, she did by never maturing. And apparently, we have found Tash in the comments, and she says, I had this post sent to me by a friend, and I think I am Tash in the story. I would like to clarify some things that Ali, the OP, has said about me. I agree that Ali and I did not get along as children, and that I was mean to her. I recognize that what I did and said was wrong, but when I tried to apologize after she had moved schools, I found that I had been blocked. 
I do not believe that it was fair of her to take away the opportunity for me to grow and be a better person. I honestly do not remember the restaurant incident, but even if I did say that fat people weren't allowed, it was probably a joke. I think that Ali is just as sensitive as when we were kids. I'm currently on placement after finishing my teaching degree and have now lost the position. It is very unlikely that I'll find more special education placement, which is why I have said that my career has been ruined by Ali. I also don't agree that I insulted Ali when she walked through the door with her husband. I told her that she used to look awful, but she looks better now. I don't think I deserve to get fired for making an observation, which was true by the way. I do think that I am now being bullied by Ali only because I bullied her when we were little, and I do not think that it's fair that she is treating me this way when I tried to apologize, but was blocked. And someone replies to her and says, oh go off, she doesn't owe you crap not the opportunity for personal growth or anything else. If you felt bad about what you did, you would apologize or accept that you can't fix it, not whine about how she deprived you. Also, observing that someone looks awful but looks so much better now is the same old mean girl bullcrap. You haven't changed at all. The only thing is now the consequences of your actions have come back to bite you in the ass, so you're whining again. And now on to the update. I felt such incredible support from everyone who had taken the time to comment on my original post or to message me privately with their own stories of bullies. And I felt quite empowered in that I was able to protect my daughter from someone who had tormented me. Unfortunately, this update is not all sunshine and rainbows because the messages from people claiming that I was now bullying Tash as retaliation became relentless. I soon also began receiving messages from an unknown number, which oscillated between non-apologies for the bullying that I sustained as a child and accusations of slander. It wasn't a big leap to think that one of my friends had passed my contact details onto Tash. I did not notice the comment from Tash until later, and while I have no idea if the user is actually her or just someone trying to troll me, also the user did get my name right. The comment was a mirror image of some of the texts that I had received. It was especially evident in that neither the comment nor the texts actually apologized for anything. It was just another way of laying the blame at my feet or whining about life. On advice from my husband, I did not respond to the texts and I blocked all the women that were messaging me about ruining Tash's life. I honestly didn't expect the situation to escalate from there. I thought that Tash and my old school friends would get it out of their system after a couple of days and move on with their lives. On Friday, two days after posting, I started receiving letters in my post box which threatened to destroy my life in the same way as I had done to other people, quote unquote. The envelopes didn't have a stamp or address on them, which leads me to believe that Tash was either putting them in my post box herself or asking someone to do it on her behalf. The third letter threatened to take me to court for stalking and slander and that I would pay. I do not know if that means that I will pay financially or that some other form of revenge will take place. It was at this point that I called the police non-emergency line and I explained the situation. While the officer that I spoke to was very friendly, he advised me that I wouldn't be able to do much unless there was a legitimate threat against my family and I. Word for word, he told me to stay in the house as much as possible. That is not really a long-term solution. I should not have to cower in my home when I have a job and a life. On Sunday morning, four days after posting, my family and I were at the farmer's market when my husband received a notification from our home alarm system that someone had broken in. My neighbor had also watched someone scale the fence and smash a window in broad daylight. So he had called the cops before we were aware of the situation. Tash was found inside the house, just sitting on the couch. So I'm not sure of her entire plan, but the cops were fantastic and she was arrested. When asked if we would like to press charges, my husband and I were emphatic that we would. We also had a meeting with the lawyer this morning about harassment charges for all the letters and text messages, but that process has only just started. Neither of us know what will happen next, but our family is safe and hopefully Tash will face some kind of justice. Now in the comments, Tash be like, but I wasn't bullying. Also Tash, he deserved to know that she wasn't pretty. Big yikes situation. Some people never grow out of high school.
Ugh, yes. Like, zero self-awareness. It was like the narcissist's prayer in real time, god damn. What was the response from the ex-friends who had been harassing you after Tash was arrested? With the way the friends had been acting, I could see them finding a way to blame OP. I could hear them saying, she had no choice but to break in. She wanted to talk to you, but you blocked her on everything. It's not like she destroyed anything. She was just sitting waiting for you to come home to talk. OP replies, I blocked all the ladies that have been texting me repeatedly, and I don't want to open that can of worms by unblocking them, mostly in fear that I'll somehow be blamed for this as well, but everyone else around me is pretty shocked that it escalated this quickly. It feels surreal, to be honest. I've never experienced anything as unhinged as this. I'm shocked that she has so many people defending her. She sounds like a miserable, entitled witch. Often these people are very charismatic, and as long as they're focused on someone else, like OP, then they are not a threat to the other friends. It's the same way that lunatics come into political power. Quote, I do not believe that it was fair for her to take away the opportunity for me to grow and be a better person. But even if I did say that fat people weren't allowed, it was probably a joke. I think that Ali is just as sensitive as when we were kids. Tell me how you haven't matured without saying you haven't matured. Even without the second comment, the first is completely unhinged. Other people are not there for you to learn lessons from, and if they are hurt, they can stop having you in their lives. It is not unfair, because they are whole, independent people too, and their sole purpose in life is not you. Our next post is titled, How do I tell my dad that my girlfriend is pregnant? He comes back in two weeks. My dad has been stationed away for nine months, and he's coming back in two weeks. I will be 20 in six weeks. I just moved out, and my place is close to home. My girlfriend is seven months pregnant and still lives at home with her parents. My dad is pretty strict. Everyone on both sides of our family knows, except my dad. I know you might be like, you're an adult, it doesn't matter what he does. But y'all have never met my father. Whenever he's around, it's always yes sir, and respect 24-7. Can't be caught lacking, no point in arguing. There isn't anything he can really do, but it doesn't mean that I'm scared crapless. So that comes to my question. How do you break the news? Should I let him enjoy being home first and then tell him, or tell him right away? And now in the comments, you are about to be the dad, dude. Time to transition from yes sir, no sir, to with all due respect, this is my decision and I have made it. And you can start by trusting your own gut on the best timing for breaking the news to him. Although personally, I'd keep in mind that the longer you put it off, the greater the chances of him hearing it from someone else first. And OP says, yes, I know. It just gets difficult to break out of that shell. Okay, I'll try to tell him early on, instead of late. Something like, Hey dad, I have some news. I hope you can be happy for me. Sally and I are expecting our first child on XXX date. Then, depending on his reaction, engage or leave. You don't have to stick around for folks who don't recognize you as an independent adult. Set boundaries for what you'll expose yourself to. Based on the information you've provided, it sounds like a career military father. His strictness comes from his sense of duty and responsibility. Everything in his life has been regimented. That's what he knows. It's unfortunate that he's translated his military world into his home life and then projected that onto you. But that's what happens with a lot of Korean military fathers. They can't separate home from work. That's what happened with my father. As for your girlfriend's pregnancy, first off, you need to decide what you're going to do. You may not know yet, but your father is most likely going to want to know. You said it yourself, no point lacking or slacking, if you mean that, either applies equally. If you tell him without knowing what you're going to do, he'll probably be disappointed that seven plus months have gone by and you haven't taken any responsibility for your actions, which will lead to him not being willing to listen to you about it and that'll just frustrate you. It'd be much better if you told him, along with whatever plan and intentions, you and your girlfriend had decided to take on the whole situation. That way he sees that you have taken responsibility from the beginning. Another piece of advice for when you talk to him, try changing your mindset to one of taking ownership. Your post says, my girlfriend is pregnant. That sounds more like you pushing it on her and it's not your problem. 
Change the way you say that to, my girlfriend is having my child. Or better, if you know the gender, my girlfriend is having my son slash daughter. She is having your child after all. He will see the reasonability in your words, even if he doesn't say it. As for when you tell him, let him decompress a bit, but don't wait too long. You don't want someone accidentally dropping the news on him. It's best coming from you. And one last thing, congratulations. And now to the update. I told my dad on Saturday. He came home, my mum cooked this huge dinner, and we all ate. And I let him get settled and just enjoy family time. I was pretty much on edge the whole dinner. I told him the next day by bringing him to my apartment, which was the last time I saw him, I still lived with my parents. It was just us. It has all the stuff for the baby. I told him outside the door and then brought him inside to see my place. He just listened and hugged me. Not the reaction I was expecting, but the reaction that I'm grateful I got. My dad's not big on emotions. He's seen stuff, been through things in his career, you know? He told me that it was going to be all right, be confident, and he loved me. I really appreciate my dad. He's taught me a lot and I'll always remember that. My girlfriend is eight months now, so the baby is coming really soon and I can't wait. I feel ready-ish, but I've never heard of someone feeling 100% ready. I just want to say thank you to everyone who commented and helped. And now in the comments, Sloppy Meat Hole says, Congrats on having a good father. I had my first son at 20, and I know how you feel. You're right, you are not ready to be a parent, but I'll let you in on a secret. No one is ever ready to be a parent. It's trial by fire. Do the best you can and be the parent you would want, and everything will work out. My son just turned 20 and made it just fine. Good luck. And OP says, thanks, sure will. Congratulations, OP. The person above you is absolutely right. I was 30 when I had my kid, and I still don't feel ready. However, sometimes I wish I'd had my kid when I was 20, because then I'd have more energy to keep up with them. But there's pros and cons to all of it. But you're going to be a great parent. This is so wholesome and nice. I'm glad you finally got to tell your dad. He's probably pretty excited to be a part of your baby's life. Congratulations, and I wish a safe and healthy delivery for both your girlfriend and baby. That grandkid is gonna be spoiled and be allowed to call his granddad Pops or Gramps while OP still has to call him Sir. <laughs> yeah, I can remember every single time I got a Happy Meal as a child. We had real food at home. My kids get fast food and dollar store trips almost daily when they're with my parents. They laugh so hard when you bring up the stick figure meme of the kid going in and out of grandma's house goes in a stick figure, goes out a circle with a dollar in his hand. It's fun to see, honestly. I love it. My dad got sweets once a week as a kid, yet every time I visited my grandma, she would give me several packets against my parents' requests. They just love to spoil you. I know my mom is gonna be the same when I have kids. My friend went through something very similar. He didn't have the guts to tell his dad before the baby was born. He just had his girlfriend come over with the baby without warning when she was six weeks old. His dad sat down and cried, the first and last time my friend ever saw him cry. Not with joy about the baby, but because he had obviously failed as a father to his son. He was horrified that his own kids were afraid of him even as young adults. He had a bit of a mental breakdown over it and changed completely as a result. He even left the military. Honestly, that would be a huge blow to me if I were a parent, that my child was scared to tell me something this important. It does sound like dad went on to make some serious changes and do better with the next generation. So at least he took it on board and worked to improve as a person. I was completely taken aback by your story. I'm still afraid of my father and I'm 59. It never occurred to me in the way your story illustrates. Wow. Am I the asshole for quietly packing my stuff and leaving my family's house without telling anyone after my dad threatened to kick me out? I, 23 female, live at home. I'm in grad school and I work part-time, plus intern at an office. I graduate in June and I've been applying to jobs as much as I can so I can finally move out. My sister, 20 female, also lives at home but is doing school online and doesn't work. 
I try to help with chores around the house as much as possible, although it's difficult since I leave the house early in the morning and come home late at night. Last week, I came home and there were clean dishes in the dishwasher. I said that I'm gonna take a quick shower and then empty the dishwasher and my dad went on a rant about how I'm useless and never help around the house and that my sister is always the one doing everything. I explained that I do help and that just because they haven't seen me help doesn't mean that I don't. He asked me to give him an example and I told him that I took the garbage out the night before. The conversation escalated to him saying that I should shut up and not argue any longer because he can easily make me homeless if he wanted to. I said okay and went upstairs. The next morning, while everyone was still asleep, I packed my things and left, and I've been sleeping in my car for a week and taking showers at my gym. Later in the day after I left, my parents called and my mum texted me asking where I am when I didn't come home when I was supposed to. I didn't reply and I blocked my entire family's numbers and social medias and haven't spoken to them since. They have been calling and texting my friends asking them where I am. I haven't told any of my friends that I'm sleeping in my car, so I got very confused texts from friends asking me what's going on and why my parents are asking where I am and if I'm safe and okay. I told my closest friend that I left home and that I'm safe and let her know to tell my parents that I'm fine, but I have no desire to speak to them anymore. They've been begging my friend to disclose my location and asking her to ask me to allow them to speak to me. I went to my friends yesterday and she told me what I did was awful and that I should speak to them. I told her that they threatened to make me homeless, so I left by my own volition but she's insisting that making them worry about my safety is a horrible thing to do. But I honestly think that I just gave them what they asked for. They wanted to get rid of me, so I left. Am I the asshole for leaving and refusing to communicate with them? Edit. My mum was there when this happened, and she was on my dad's side as well, so she's aware of the incident and knows that I was threatened to be made homeless. They also said that I was most likely never going to get a job and was going to stay at home forever, even though I have two jobs right now. The internship is unpaid though, and I'm actively looking for a full-time job. And yes, they've done this before. And now in the comments, not the asshole, but maybe talk to your local PD and let them know that if your parents try to file a missing persons report, it's a waste of time because you are not missing. They threatened to kick you out for not helping, so you left. Sounds like a win-win to me. Can you talk to any of your friends about staying with them while you get things together? This is important. People leaving abusive relationships can often have the perpetrators file missing person reports, another method of exerting control. Also, obviously, OP is not the asshole. They want their house elf back. Info. I assume the dishwasher incident is the straw that broke the camel's back? Otherwise, secretly moving out and cutting communication does seem a tad extreme if it was the only trigger. In any case, you're an adult and I hope it doesn't take long for you to find your own place. And OP replies, they have done this many times before. When I was 16, I had an argument with my mom because she went through my phone and then my mom told my dad that she can't live with me in the same house and that it's either her or I in the house. So I ended up getting kicked out and I stayed with a friend for a week until she came and picked me up and apologized and said they'd never kick me out again. Which wasn't true because it's the one threat that gets made anytime something happens. Not the asshole. Is there anyone you can stay with until you find a place? Sleeping in cars can be dangerous. I'm sorry that you're dealing with this. Congratulations on graduating grad school. And OP says, thank you. I am looking into finding a shelter to stay in until I can afford a place as I don't want to bother my few friends, so I think a shelter would be a better option. Someone replies to that, if I had a friend going through that, I would absolutely want to be bothered with this. If they are really your friends, let them help you. Not the asshole. Sounds like you were majorly stressed out and having someone scream at you in a place that is supposed to be a calm, safe environment is just not helpful at all. I'm guessing your mum doesn't know what happened. I would at least tell her. And OP says, no, she was there when this happened and she was on my dad's side. He was the one mainly throwing the insults, but she chimed in a few times as well and had a lot to say. And now on to the update. 
I want to say thank you to everyone who commented and PM'd me with advice after my first post almost two months ago. I received a lot of helpful advice that I took into consideration when planning what to do next. A week after my post, I ended up moving in with a friend who was kind enough to let me stay and pay a very small amount in rent in return. I also ended up talking to my parents and my dad apologized for his behavior and promised to never make a threat like that again, which honestly came as a shock to me, but I'm glad things got resolved between us. I let them know that I'm staying with a friend and paying a small amount in rent in the meantime and that I'm in the process of finding an apartment, and they suggested that I move back in with them for free until I find a job and a place. So I took their offer and I moved back home and I haven't had issues with them since moving back. I finished grad school and completed my internship and two weeks ago, I landed a full-time job in my field. I also found an apartment that's only a five minute walk from my job. I start the job next week and I move into my new place two weeks from now. And now in the comments, I read your previous post and I realized just how often Indian parents say this to their kids without actually meaning any of it. What they don't realize is that it affects the self-esteem of children heavily. It's such a toxic dynamic that has been so normalized that they don't even realize that they are saying something so detrimental to their child's mental health. Eastern European parents as well. Yes, our cultures preach resilience, but it's tough when so much of the self-esteem trauma comes from those you're supposed to feel safest with and spend most time with, as a youth at least. I'm always so happy when I hear a good ending. I wish you all the happiness in the world, OP. As a long time lurker, I'm used to seeing these toxic family posts where the OP is forced to go low contact or no contact and the asshole party refuses to apologize and doubles down. So it's nice to see a healthy resolution to a domestic conflict where the asshole admits their fault and relationships can begin to mend. Not every conflict will end as amicably. Plus, it's great to hear of the success that OP has had in her career and living arrangements. I'm a bit conflicted on how to feel about this. I can make you homeless, so stop trying to defend yourself is a grade A crap thing to say and way to parent, but OP still moves back in with them? But then again, we don't know how much deeper things went along with the apology. This might have been a much needed bucket of ice water over the dad's head that woke him up to how truly bad he's been. I'm rather curious if the parents saw that OP's efforts at the chores were noticeable in her absence. Not saying the sister was slacking off, just saying that if it was a kind of 60-40 thing, did the parents soon notice that this 60 of it had walked out the door? It brings me peace of mind that so many people are responding to you with similar experiences, even though I also would much rather be alone in this issue because it means that there are more people like me who are hurt. My parents are like that manipulative, constantly kicking you down to make sure you never excel in life because they're afraid that you'll be better off than them. A star sibling who could amount to nothing in life and somehow always does and achieve more. You are desperate for their love and approval because that's how you've been raised. Them beating you down and you having to make up for it. It's the only type of parental love you have ever experienced. It's your normal, even if it isn't to others. It takes a crap ton of time to crawl out of it, and even the odds of you being manipulated again are extremely high. It has taken me seven years to cut my mother out of my life, and she is still dragging me back in. I have deleted all social media, except Reddit, changed my phone number about 15 times, moved four times, gotten a new job when no one knows me, and she still finds a way back in. Same for my dad. In their stories, they are the victims. That's the story they tell others, making the child the devil in it. Notice how in OP's story, many people contacted her, guilt tripping her, possibly relaying info to her parents, how she was fearful to tell any of her closest friends but one what was going on. Trauma. She has been taught not to trust anyone. Our next post is titled, Colorado. My ex lied about vaccinating our immune compromised eight year old daughter. She now has chickenpox and is in the hospital. I want my ex as far away from my daughter as possible. Me and my ex split up before our daughter's birth. There were a variety of reasons for this that I won't get into here. One of them though was her anti-science beliefs. She's an anti-vaxxer and doesn't trust science or medicine at all. 
Well, this sucks because our daughter was born premature and immunocompromised. We have 50-50 custody of her, but due to her condition and my wife's anti-science beliefs, we argue constantly on how to handle her. Well, recently, our daughter has made incredible progress, and last year was given the go-ahead to get vaccinated for certain viruses, including chickenpox and the flu. My ex went crazy about this and started making my life a living hell, and threatened up and down to take me to court. Around this time, I also got a new job that paid a considerable amount more than my old. When this happened, I decided that I wanted to move my girl into a private school that has a program for immune-compromised children and offered to pay 100% tuition. The only problem, for her at least, is that this school requires students to be fully vaccinated up to their medically allowed limits in my daughter's case. My ex fought me up and down on this and we ended up in court. The judge agreed with me and ordered my daughter to be vaccinated. X had a full breakdown, but in the end, agreed only on the condition she get to take her to lessen the emotional damage and make sure the doctor doesn't poison her. I demanded the medical forms confirming this and she agreed. So, my daughter finally got vaccinated and last fall started at her awesome new school. Well, last week, my daughter got incredibly sick and had to be rushed to the hospital from school. She somehow had contracted chickenpox despite being vaccinated for it. I have been stressed out from the minute that I got the call and confused as hell how she got it. My daughter must have picked up on this and thought that I was mad at her because when I was visiting her in the hospital, she decided to tell me the secret that mummy promised to make her keep. Turns out, my ex didn't vaccinate her. She made my daughter lie about it. Instead, she has been using special oils and salts to keep her from getting sick. So, what about the forms I got saying that she was vaccinated? They are fake. I called the doctor and it turns out she never went in and he never signed any forms confirming she was vaccinated. So my ex lied and faked forms to convince me that she was vaccinated. I am pissed to say the least. My daughter is in the hospital because my ex decided to let her beliefs come before our child's health. My ex doesn't know that I know yet and I told my daughter not to tell her. I want her gone now. How do I approach this to make sure my ex suffers for this? I have the forms that she handed me and texts from the day she took her. I also have the doctor on record saying he never signed off on these and that the ones I have are forged. I'm planning on speaking to a lawyer, but I would like to know going in what to do. Thank you. And now in the comments, she was ordered by a judge to do something. Not only did she not do it, but she forged medical documents and lied in the process of not doing it. Beyond any other issue that she could get in trouble for, neglect, child safety issues, CPS issues, this is unambiguously problematic. If you have a copy of the initial court order, you could probably request one if you don't have it, that should be one of the first things that you bring up with an attorney. Forgery, medical neglect, gross negligence with damages and contempt of court also may be fraud. Depending on jurisdiction, some just require damage to be done by misrepresenting fact for personal gain, then require intent to cause harm for, and others require financial interest. That is one hell of a sentencing. I am not a lawyer, however, this one detail stuck out to me. Quote, when this happened, I decided I want to move my girl into a private school, and the only problem, for her at least, is that this school requires students to be fully vaccinated, up to their medically allowed limit in my daughter's case. Your ex's decision didn't only endanger your daughter's life, she endangered all of the children there. There is a non-zero chance that some of the children there are now infected with chickenpox as well, and depending on their own health, chances are it's even worse for them than your daughter. As you pointed out, your daughter is already hospitalized. This may directly kill someone. My question for the actual lawyers here, can the school take action against the ex? What about the other parents at the school? I feel like they have a very strong case, especially if, and I really hope this doesn't happen, someone dies because of the ex's malicious actions. At the very least, it would help the case to get the ex's custody removed. And now on to the update. Wow, that last post got real popular it seems, for better and for worse. 
Seeing as you guys were interested in it, I thought that I would come back with an update. Well, a lot has happened since that day. My daughter is safe with me and was let out of the hospital about a week ago. She's getting better every day. I know though, you guys want the full story, so here it is. After I made that post, I took the advice given to me, and the next time I saw my daughter, I told her that it was wrong of me to ask her to keep secrets, and that it's okay to tell her mom. Along with that, I saw a lawyer recommended to me by a trusted party. When I went to see him, he told me that this is a case that lawyers salivate over, and that my ex is in a lot of trouble. I immediately filed for emergency custody of my daughter. I also got into contact with the doctor again, and explained the situation fully to him. He says that while he will not be getting lawyers involved, that he wishes for me to submit the evidence to the police and file a report. Along with this, my lawyer has gotten into contact with the court that originally ordered us to vaccinate our daughter and has handed over everything that I gave to him. He has advised me to stay quiet on this matter, so I will leave it at my ex is in a lot of trouble with him. During this time, my ex started to get suspicious. Maybe it was because a friend told her about a post on Reddit and she freaked out? Who knows? A few days later, when I saw her at the hospital, we had an altercation. She became hysterical and yelled various threats and insults at me, including telling me that I want to poison our daughter right in front of our sick child. She was escorted out of the building and the head nurse had banned her from coming back. After this, she sent me a barrage of texts telling me that I am a monster and that if she had vaccinated her that she would be dead now. This was sent to my lawyer. As he puts it, she is what lawyers dream of when they hear who is on the other side of the court. Outside of this, I've been advised to stay as quiet as possible, so I'll leave with this. This week, I received emergency custody of my daughter until our custody hearing later this year. I have heard that the DA is slowly getting ready to move forward with a multitude of charges against my ex, and that will land her in jail soonish. And that's really it for now. I'm going to follow the advice given by my lawyer and say nothing else to anyone. I do not want the media involved in this for a few reasons, so I've left this as vague as possible. When it's all said and done, if the interest is still there, I may come back again. But for now, thanks for the advice in the original thread. Me and my daughter appreciate you all. And now to the final update. Hello again everyone out there. Three years ago, I made a post about how my ex lied about vaccinating our daughter. Soon after, I gave an update and disappeared over the horizon. I had completely forgotten about making that post, as the last few years dealing with a global pandemic and an immunocompromised daughter have aged me three decades. But I saw a post recently talking about my own posts, and it came back like a ton of bricks. After wrestling to get back into this account, here I am. I hope you're all still interested in an update. Well, to give the short answer first, I have full custody of my daughter and my ex is barred from having any contact with her. The long answer, my court battle between my ex and me was a grueling process, one of the worst periods of my life. It took over five months from the time that I got emergency custody to get full custody of my daughter. In retrospect, those five months were not as long as they felt, but they felt like the longest months of my life at that point. My ex's harassment at that time got worse, even coming to my house and attempting to force herself in to take our daughter. She was arrested for this and charged with attempted forced entry. Before she could bail herself out, the DA decided to throw the book at her for forging medical documents. She ended up spending a month in jail for this, which unfortunately got our custody case continued. The upside of this was that I was given a protective order for me and my daughter out of this. One that bit her in the ass when we finally got in front of a judge. I was given full custody of my daughter. My ex and her lawyer pissed off the judge by trying to claim that I had planned this all from the start, forcing her into a corner to vaccinate our daughter so that I could use her response to initiate the custody battle. Her actions, her upcoming hearing for committing felony forgery and forced entry, along with the protective order, convinced the judge that my ex was more than a danger to our daughter. She lost all custodial rights, and as of now, is not legally allowed to contact her in any form. My protective order was extended by two years as well, but I didn't need it, as it was only a few months later that she went to prison. 
My ex pleaded out, they dropped the forced entry charge, and she only got two years in prison for the forgery, but was still hit with the felony. She was released early due to COVID though. Since then, luckily, I have had no contact with my ex outside of getting the child support that I am owed. I'm not really inclined to keep tabs on her personal life, but I do know that she went off the conspiracy deep end. She is now a full QAnon supporter and dating someone who was involved in the January 6th insurrection. Other than that, she has disappeared from my daughter's life entirely. As for me and my daughter, the past few years have been a living nightmare. We moved to a new state and I had to put her into fully online schooling, but our lives are great. And amazingly, my daughter was able to get the COVID vaccine only a month ago and is cleared to go to physical school once the summer ends. This saga of my life has taught me so many things. I am grateful every day to have my daughter with me, safe, and in a place where she can slowly grow and get healthier. It's kind of touching that so many people are interested after all this time in a normal guy like me and my daughter. I genuinely hope this is the last update that I have to make. Thank you for your interest and see you all over the next horizon. And now in the comments, well, this is good news. It hits home because of my own ex and my stepchildren, a battle that I lost. The most beautiful text I got was from my chosen daughter when she was of age. I got vaccinated of my own accord. I cried for so very long. Look, you lost the battle, but you won the war. The fact that you fought for them is something they'll always carry with them. Knowing that you're wanted is everything. This was me with my ex and his kids. Their mum was fine and her husband was too, but my ex tried to make her life a living hell and made mine a living hell in the process. One of them turned 20 today and I still get to have them in my life and I am forever grateful. While I lost the battle with him, I won the war. What kind of crockpot lawyer did she find that was willing to argue in court that her ex forced her to commit felony forgery to get custody? And OP replies, No clue to be honest with you. They left out the fact that she, you know, committed a crime? Their argument was that I used her beliefs against her and that my original goal was to use the vaccination to force a judge to give me full custody because my ex wouldn't allow her to be vaccinated. My guess is that the lawyer took her money and then asked questions later. I can only imagine Crazy Pants' social media posts about the conspiracies against her and how her daughter was stolen and poisoned and it's the deep state and whatever other nonsense she conjures. I hope the daughter is okay emotionally with not having her around, but man, that's a lot. QAnon seems quite popular with estranged parents from what I hear. For these people, it's easier to invent an insane conspiracy than take responsibility, sadly. It makes me worried about my mom. She's mostly fine now, but I can see the signs. I fear that she's only one bad day from going off the deep end sometimes. This happened the other day. I, 23 male, was at a pool party at my best friend Greg's house. There was also a slip and slide set set up and people were using it. My friend Amy used it and screamed. The whole party turns to her and she's clutching her breast and there's blood just pouring out of her hand. She had slid over a rock and cut herself. I'm in nursing school so I run over and ask to see the cut. She pulls her hand away and I see that it doesn't look too serious, but it definitely needs attention. I turn to Greg and ask him if he has a first aid kit and he says yes, in the bathroom inside the house. So I walk Amy into the house and grab the first aid kit. I pause for a second and ask her if she's okay with me helping her with this or if she wants to do it herself because of where the cut is. And she says, no, I trust you and I want your help. So we go into the bathroom and wash out the cut. I look at it more closely to make sure it isn't serious. I then put some Neosporin on it and I bandage it up nicely. Amy thanks me and we go back outside. A couple women come up to Amy and ask if she's okay and one of them, Sarah, gives me a dirty look and they kind of lead her away. I go back to where I was sitting and Greg sits next to me and says, Some people were talking crap out here. I did my best to defend you, but I figured you should know that they were talking crap about you helping Amy. I asked him what he meant and he said that Sarah was saying that it was creepy how I sprung into action when I saw an opportunity to play with a boob. And a few of the other women and one guy agreed and were making fun of me. 
I was pretty upset about that, but I didn't want to make a scene, so I just ignored it for the time being. Later that day though, I was sitting by the fire pit, and Sarah was sitting across from me, and nobody else was around the area. So I asked her why she was making fun of me for helping Amy, and she said, I guess that was a little mean of me. I'm sorry that I did that, but I just thought that it was kind of weird how you saw her boob was hurt, and you ran up to her and insisted that you help. I know that you're in nursing school, but I think that you should have just let a girl handle it. We all know first aid too. I thanked her for her apology, and I don't like confrontation, so I just said, all right, I guess I'll keep that in mind from now on. OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I jumped into action to help a friend with an injury, but I might be the asshole because it was an injury on her breast, and my friend said that I should have just let another woman help her. Not the asshole. If it comes up again, I'd suggest you remind all those folks that bystander effect is real, and no one else was jumping in to help. Knowing first aid is only valuable if the person enacts that training in an urgent slash emergency situation. Seriously, why didn't she help if she knows so much about first aid? And what if it was more serious? She specifically said she trusted him. How immature is this person for making medical attention into something to make fun of? I know that if I sliced my boob open on a rock to the point that it was bleeding that heavily in a situation where all my female friends were around, even my best friends and someone who was medically trained, no matter who responds first, I would absolutely be like, hey OP, no pressure, but if you're comfortable, would you double check if this is a band-aid injury or an urgent care injury? The woman and the one jealous guy talking crap are all immature morons. So, you asked, the person in question said they were okay with you doing it, and then a bunch of people that didn't rush to help are complaining about it. Not the asshole OP. Sarah should have rushed there if she wanted to help so much. A general rule of thumb is not to wait on injuries. Edit, I stepped away to go to work and this post blew up. Thank you all for your judgments. I think I did the right thing by helping her in this situation, and Sarah was really kind of a cow here. Also, I realized that Amy might not know that they were talking crap about me, so I'm going to call or text her and inform her about all this. The update. So I called Amy and asked her how the cut was healing. She said that it was healing well, and she was keeping an eye on it, and then I asked her if she knew about the things that Sarah and the others said about me, and what Sarah said at the fire pit. Amy had no idea. She said the other women were asking her if she was okay and what happened and all that, but she assumed that they were worried about the injury, not my helping her. And Amy was absolutely pissed and went to the friend group chat and tore the people that were crap talking a new asshole, especially Sarah. Sarah and the others apologized to me in the group chat, but Amy kept going and said that I shouldn't accept their apologies because they sat back and talked crap on the one person who stepped up and helped her. Amy also asked Greg not to invite Sarah to the next pool party, and Greg readily agreed. A few of the others tried to say that that was too far, but Amy just told them to shut the F up and do something next time someone's hurt instead of sitting on their ass and insulting me. If they were actually concerned, one of the girls would have gone to supervise, not sit there and assume that Amy was being taken advantage of. Agree. I went spelunking and got stuck one time as I couldn't pull my body up and a male stranger behind me asked if it was okay to touch me, then held my thighs to push me up. Maybe less than a minute of physical contact? I had zero issues with it and was grateful for the help. The couple ahead of me asked if I was comfortable with that afterwards, when both of them didn't ask if they can help pull me up. Huh, I had something like that happen too. A guy told me that I was walking around with my skirt tucked up under my backpack, which meant that my underwear were fully on display. Afterwards, a lady nearby asked me about it and was like, he was looking at your backside. Yeah, him and half of the city. He had a front row seat, and if he wanted to continue looking, he could have just let me continue walking around like that. Also, if she had noticed that whole scene, why didn't she say anything? There is no way that I'd have let someone parade her granny panties down a street like that. Ridiculous. Damn, Amy really shredded them like paper, and she did good. 
She was right. OP was the only one that got up while the women sat idle. And OP knew what he was doing and he was very respectful and asked for consent at every step. And Amy gave consent at every step. And she was perfectly clear in stating that she trusted OP to help her and went willingly. Sarah tried to turn Amy into a victim without Amy's consent, and she talked a lot of crap behind both of their backs. And she tried to turn OP into a sexual predator when they all knew that he wasn't coming from that space at all. Plus, I'd trust a person in nursing school to help me more than someone who knows basic first aid, because I know that the nursing student won't half-ass it. Plus, if that student is a close friend, all the better. Husband is physically abusive. He's a cop. I can't escape. Help? I am completely dependent on my husband. He sees all my movement, and I'm pretty sure he's planted one of those apple tags in my car. He is very violent. I've called the police. They didn't do anything, even when I had two black eyes. I have no family. I'm estranged from all of my friends. I think he's going to kill me. Help, Ohio. OP, go to a library. From there, ask if they can let you call a hotline. If he tracks you there, do not leave with him. Remain calm and in a public area. In addition to local help, I suggest calling RAINN. I don't know if your abuse is also sexual, but they are used to helping with dangerous and difficult situations. Tell them that your abuser is law enforcement and they will help you find a shelter that he cannot access. Be very clear that you're afraid for your life and with an injury that he has done to you. If he has choked you, then lead with that information. Do not worry about anything that can be replaced. They can help you with that. The most dangerous time is when your abuser thinks you're about to leave. Get out now. Make up an emergency bag and hide it in a safe place until you are ready to leave. So, phone charger, some cash, a change of clothes, medication, ID slash documents, etc. Get in touch with your local domestic abuse service and ask about seeking refuge. They can help you plan and execute an exit strategy. If you feel unsafe in your local area, explain this to them and they may be able to move you out of town slash state. Delete your browser history, cookies, call logs, etc. as soon as you can. Leave your car and use public transport if possible. If not, then leave your car at least a few blocks away from your destination. The further, the better. Do not, under any circumstances, tell him or even imply that you will leave. The most dangerous times for victims of DA is when the abuser feels they are losing control over you. Once you are gone, block your abuser on everything, because he will try to manipulate you into coming back. It's possible that he will use different numbers to attempt to contact you, so you may want to either buy a burner phone with cash or change your phone number when you get the chance. Good luck, OP, and please stay safe. Staying alive is your number one priority. If you need to just run to an estranged friend's house, please do so, unless they are friendly slash on speaking terms with your abuser. And now on to the update. Hello all. First of all, I'm alive. Second of all, thank you all so much. In my first post, I was really, really scared because I thought my husband might kill me. I'm glad to say that I made it out. After the threat, I got new motivation and energy to go out. I made a little emergency bag and hid it in the laundry room under the dirty pile. I started keeping petty cash from my shopping trips. With the petty cash, I bought a very cheap prepaid phone that I used to call a woman's shelter. They helped me make a plan and got me out of there. That was by far the scariest night of my life. I left when I knew that my husband had night shift. I was so scared that he somehow found out what I was planning and was hiding out to catch me. I had been very careful too. I was sweet to him, acted as if he had broken me successfully, acted on his every wish. You know, it was very painful. But that night at 3am, I finally escaped with my little bag. I left behind my phone. That same day, I had sold my laptop. I told my husband that I wanted to put some cash forward to his gaming PC so he wouldn't mind. I got an old tablet with SIM function for very cheap too, so that I had the rest of the 500 bucks of my laptop sale for me. I left the car behind and everything. I left the house and just ran till I arrived at a McDonald's and from there, I ordered an Uber to the pickup place. 
As soon as I arrived, they helped me close everything that could be closed. Email, cash app, my bank account, etc, etc, and they helped me get an amazing lawyer. So right now I'm in the shelter, alive and well. I finally managed to get a TRO till the divorce hearing. My lawyer is realistic with the case. But everything that matters is that I am no longer scared of going to sleep at night and never waking up. Thank you so much. I am so glad that she made it out. Those officers who did nothing, even when she had two black eyes, are cowards. F them. And this is why my mum belonged to an underground railroad for women, and why our root cellar had a bed hidden in the jelly shelves. It is amazing that your mum did that, but it's also horrible that women have to hide like that. Has the hidden bed ever been necessary? Like for a man who found your house but not the woman? Or was it a precaution? We were never a long-term spot, a few nights at most, once a week due to bad weather. So the woman would get smuggled in, set up in the root cellar, and then waited for a call. The door could be hidden behind her sewing cupboard. Honestly, the only time the door wasn't covered was if it was canning time or we had nobody inside. Only once did a guy get close to finding his ex, but he was a day too late and mum's shotgun convinced him to leave the driveway. Well, once that I know of, because I'd gotten home from school at the wrong time. When my cousin was 18, she dated a guy who was 21 and was an abusive, manipulative psycho. She only dated him for six months. She broke up with him in public to reduce any possibility of things going wrong, but that didn't stop him from screaming and crying and getting on his knees to beg her for another chance. A few weeks later, he called her saying he was outside of her house and just wanted to talk. It was midnight. She didn't want to, but was worried that he would try getting into the house, so she got in his car, and as soon as she was in, he locked the doors and sped off. She said he drove erratically, and she was screaming for him to stop. He went to a park, and parked in the furthest, darkest part of the park. She said that he went on a rant, screaming, crying, name-calling. Then she noticed what looked like a knife. While he was freaking out, she managed to get the door open and jumped out and ran and hid in some bushes. He drove around with his high beams on looking for her. She waited in the bushes until dawn and then made a run for the nearest houses. Got someone to answer their door and used the phone to call my uncle to come get her. A few years later, he posted on MySpace, yes, this was a while ago, that he had been accepted for the police academy in our city. So my cousin went to the local police station and told them what she had experienced, basically saying there is no way that he's fit to be a police officer. The officers she told shrugged and said, he was a kid, he's probably different now. He is not different now. So for some backstory, my fiance Annie and I have known each other since we were children and began dating junior year of high school. After high school, we both went to our state school and I asked her to marry me junior year of undergrad. I have always dreamt of being a doctor, as has she. When the application process began, I applied to a good mix of MD and DO schools of varying degrees of selectivity, though all med schools are insanely selective. I had initially planned on continuing my education and my state institution because I did not want to take on too much debt. I did end up getting into my state school's med school, but I was also unexpectedly offered a spot at one of the best med schools in the country, i.e. top three in New England, as we're from the West Coast. I would have been inclined to reject the offer had I not also qualified for a partial but still significant scholarship. It would still cost me more out of pocket than my state school would, but not significantly so, maybe a couple thousand dollars more. Annie, despite pleas from myself, our parents, professors, advisors, etc., applied to only our state school and to some insanely selective top 10 MD schools that she, to be blunt, had no chance of getting into given her admittedly mediocre grades and research experience. She was rejected from all the schools that she applied to, including our state institution. Obviously, this crushed her, and I've tried my best to support her during a difficult time and to help her remain optimistic. Our situation now is this. I am currently enrolled at the aforementioned New England Medical School, while Annie has decided to take a year off to strengthen her profile with research experience, physician shadowing, etc., and is currently living with me. 
There were no jobs open related to her undergrad major, political science, here or in our home state, that would have been able to give her sufficient time off for research. So she's currently working part-time in the retail industry. I have tried my best to be completely supportive of her, as I know this is a difficult time for her, and I have never ever said, I told you so, or anything along those lines. This is what ended up happening on Friday night. I was home, studying for a test on Monday, when Annie came home from work. She came over to my desk and kissed me. I asked her how her day went, and she didn't respond, and suddenly looked very pissed off. After a few moments, she said, what the F is wrong with you? While pointing at an anatomical diagram of a vagina in my textbook, I was speechless. After regaining my composure, I managed to let out a surprised, what do you mean? I'm studying. To which she said something along the lines of, you know what the F I mean. Why the F are you looking at pictures of women's vaginas? This was very strange because she knows that I occasionally watch porn and has no problem with it. In fact, I know that she enjoys porn from time to time as well. I explained to her that I have to take anatomy in medical school, but she wasn't having it. She took my textbook and stormed off to our bedroom and locked the door. I could hear her crying and I kept apologizing. After a few minutes, she opened the door and threw her engagement ring at me before slamming it shut again to continue crying. I continued apologizing, but she did not respond at all. I spent the rest of the night on the couch. Saturday morning, she wasn't home. I checked my phone and there was a text from her saying that she was staying with a friend and that she was done with us unless I dropped out of medical school and found another job because, and this is an honest to God text from her, she doesn't want me ogling at vaginas like an effing pervert. This is completely out of character for her. She has always been level-headed and reasonable and has no history of mental illness or anything like that. I am not a stupid person, and I know that this has way more to do than a picture of an effing vagina in an anatomy textbook, but I have no idea what to do right now. She has stopped responding to texts and won't pick up her phone. I spoke to the friend that she's staying with who basically called me an effing asshole and said that Annie is crying and getting drunk and that neither of them want me to come over to speak with her. Her parents passed away when we were young children and she doesn't have any siblings or much other family. I have no idea what to do anymore. I love her more than anything, but there is absolutely no way I am dropping out of medical school for her. And I would rather that we break up than I bend to her completely unreasonable demands. But I am very concerned for her mental health right now and need any advice that I can get. Underlying cause, she's feeling insecure because you got into medical school and she did not. Therefore, she feels bad about herself and your success is rubbing salt into the wound. Regardless of whether or not you mean to, it is. Also, I'm taking you at your word that she has previously been a reasonable person and has had no prior issues with porn or sexuality. I have three hypotheses. One, mental illness. She has flipped out in some way. Bear in mind, she's at the right age to do so. Two, an affair. She has found someone and has whipped up this pretext in order to dump you. Or three, manipulation. She has decided to sabotage your career and this is the way that she has chosen. Seems unlikely since she left. If it's two or three and she's doing it consciously, well, good riddance. It might be worth reaching out to the friend to see if you can have a calm conversation. After all, who knows what she's told her. I would reiterate to the friend that this behavior seems strange and atypical to Annie and that you are concerned. Maybe reaching out with a note that she can read and respond to at her leisure. Yes to the underlying cause. She's breaking down because her med school plans didn't work out, and she's upset to see you deeply focused on studying when she probably wishes that you would focus on her problems some too, which she should be able to ask for, but doesn't seem to be doing correctly at all. She's insecure and feels inadequate and helpless to get back on track towards her plans for med school. If she's always been reasonable in the past, and this is a fluke event, maybe it's best to try to help her with these root issues. Obviously, her demands about you dropping out are irrational, but all that looks like to me is that she needs validation that she is important to you. 
Saying I'd rather dump you than dump the med school isn't even helpful if it's true. Saying staying in med school is best for our relationship is better. If you do manage to get her to talk, reassure her that your feelings about her haven't changed because she didn't get into med school. She obviously feels like crap about herself, and it might be helpful for her to know that you don't see her that way. I get where she's coming from, she's totally dependent on you, and that makes her question what she even has to offer you. Tell her why you were with her in the first place, and that you don't want to lose that. She also must be feeling shitty that she is not currently working toward her dream of becoming a doctor. If you guys manage to patch things, maybe talk to her about what an awesome resource she has in this New England city with a top three med school. There must be great opportunities there. You mentioned she wanted research experience, physician shadowing, etc. Is she working on those things or just the retail? If you have any connections there that you could offer, do that. Skip the part where you berate her for being unreasonable and just reach out to her by saying that you understand why she's upset and that you were sorry. You don't have to mention the diagram because that's irrelevant, but you do understand why she'd be upset in general and you probably are sorry that she is upset. That should hopefully allow you to skip a stupid conversation about the diagram. And now on to the update. I'll save you the trouble. She wasn't cheating, nor was she pregnant. Yesterday, I decided that enough was enough, and I headed over to where she was staying intent on ending the relationship. When I got there, she was half drunk, and what followed was a lot of screaming and cussing directed at me. I learned why she wanted me to drop out. It had nothing to do with textbook vaginas. When I was a sophomore, two of my friends dropped out of college to work on their tech startup full time and invited me to come work with them. My undergrad degree was in comp sci. I rejected the offer because I wanted to concentrate on my dream of becoming a doctor. Fortunately, their startup did very well and last year they sold it to a large tech company for a very large sum of money in the low eight figures. I was thrilled for them. After they sold the company, both of them obviously had large lifestyle changes. One of them proposed to his girlfriend with a ridiculously effing big diamond, and they are frequently vacationing in exotic locations with family and significant others. Apparently, their success in lifestyles made my girlfriend extremely jealous, and she came up with the vagina thing as a way for me to drop out of med school, because she thinks that I can easily get a job making 150k a year at a bank so we wouldn't have to live like frickin' refugees, and that I'm an effing idiot for not doing so. Still, I was confused. I asked her about our dreams of being doctors. It turns out she never really wanted to go into medicine, but only claimed to because it was all I ever talked about. I guess that explains her application strategy. I was done. I broke up with her on the spot and told her not to contact me again. She is going to continue staying with the friend while we figure out a living arrangement. If she thinks it's so easy to land a 150k job in banking at 22, why doesn't she just do that herself? Look, everybody, this guy doesn't know about the job tree. In what world did she think this plan was going to work out? Look, you go back to your friends and retroactively take part in their startup. There, problem solved. Buy me a 20 carat diamond ring with your wealth. Look, why can't she get the big bank job and buy herself a ring? I know I would. I was thinking she's jealous because he's studying medicine and she isn't. Now I know why she wasn't accepted and probably still wouldn't be into any school because what sort of a dumb person is this? I'm glad that OP broke up with her. I started with this feeling as well. I ended with, damn, this chick didn't want a career. She wanted a meal ticket. Which just makes it all even dumber because if OP is going to a top three med school in the US, then he will likely be making bank in the not too distant future. Like much more than the 150k bar she seems to have set for them. It's just stupid on so many levels. All of this could have been avoided if they had just broken up before he moved away instead of keeping it in until it blew up. Also, they're 22, but their friends already sold their startup in the low eight figures. What the heck? I met a group like this. Their business is basically an influencer marketing agency. I felt so old because that concept wouldn't have occurred to me in a million years. They were like 21 to 25 or something. 
I remember reading about how the concept of putting men on the moon was so new that the majority of people who worked on it were in their early to mid 20s. All I could remember at that age is figuring out the numerous undiagnosed traumas I had because of shitty childhood. Makes me feel odd thinking that my life basically started at mid 30s when so many people had already accomplished so much. I got engaged to my fiance, Eric, two months ago. He moved in with me and my daughter, Zoe. Everything was going well until he started complaining about Zoe's cat, which is strange because the cat is so sweet and quiet most of the time, and so I had no idea what the issue was exactly. Anyways, he went from complaining about the cat to making demands about her. He gave Zoe a list of places the cat can and can't go, things she is allowed to touch, banned her from places like the kitchen and sofa, which is Zoe's favorite place to cuddle with her cat. Zoe showed me this list, and I had an argument with him telling him he needed to stop this because it was ridiculous. He ranted about this being his house too, and how he expected things to change after we get married. A few days ago, I was at work and got a call from Zoe, crying, saying her cat wasn't in her room and in the house. I freaked out too, and went home to look for her. Zoe and I looked for two hours before a neighbor of ours brought her out and told us that he saw Eric leaving her outside and getting in his car and leaving. I was surprised and quite angry. Zoe took her cat and went back inside. I immediately drove to my future in-law's home where Eric said he would be. The second I saw him sitting with his family, I went off and blew up at him in front of everyone. His mom asked what was happening, and I told her that her son got my daughter's indoor cat outside the house, probably hoping for her to get lost. He argued about wanting me to stop spouting nonsense and go home, and we would talk there instead, but I refused. It got worse, and I ended up leaving after his family flipped out at him. He sent a bunch of texts talking about the stunt I pulled in front of his family. He said that he didn't mean to leave the cat out, but after checking the cams, I confirmed it. He still insisted that I humiliated him in front of his family and tried to turn them against him. He's been staying with a friend and has stopped calling and texting. Am I the asshole for blowing up on him in front of his family? Not the asshole. What he did is horrible, but what it says about him is way worse. He doesn't just lack empathy, but also respect for you and your daughter and integrity. OP should not only dump Eric, but she should take that video footage straight to the police and file a complaint of animal abandonment. In my state, that's a misdemeanor. Yes, OP, please press charges. You need this man out of your house. This was him attempting to kill the cat without getting his hands dirty. Next time, he'll make sure the cameras are off and the cat doesn't live. His house too? Really? He moved in and now makes all the rules? How much do you value this controlling relationship? This man is going to get worse and more demanding. Set your boundaries and toss this person to the roadside. You and your daughter will be much happier in the long run. Quote, he expects things to change after we get married? Big red flag. The best choice is no wedding at all. Yep, this is the statement that jumped out at me as well. Do not marry this man, OP. He is controlling as hell and wants you to keep quiet about it. He's starting off small by using his authority to ban the cat from certain places and rooms. It won't stop there. Next story. For background, I'm recovering from an eating disorder. Part of my recovery means that if I'm hungry, I need to eat. I need to get used to responding to hunger by eating. If I don't eat when I'm hungry, it can become a habit and I could relapse. I know that's hard for a lot of people to understand, but it's the best way that I can explain it. I always carry snacks to accommodate this. My boyfriend asked me to go to a family event with him at his aunt's house. Dinner was at 6.30, but the gathering started at 4 and we were on time. Around 5.30, I started to feel hungry, so I ate a small granola bar to reinforce the eat when you're hungry rule. Dinner was at 6.30 and excellent. When we left, my boyfriend was upset. He said that I offended his family by eating a snack before dinner was served and implied they were bad hosts. He said that I should have waited. I reminded him that I have to eat when I'm hungry. He said dinner was in an hour and should have been sufficient to enforce the rule, but it doesn't work that way. I have to eat as soon as I realize I'm hungry or it's a slippery slope that could lead to me going without food. 
Boyfriend was angry and accused me of wanting attention and being inconsiderate. Should I have waited? Was I being too rigid? Not the asshole. Seems to me it's the other way around and he's the one being too frigid. You have a valid explanation as to why you have a snack and anyone in the know would be understanding of that. Plus, it's a granola bar. That's like the definition of a quick, easy, non-messy snack. It's not like she walked in there with a fast food bag or asked to use their microwave to make a meal or something. I definitely can relate. I've had some food related issues before and when I get hungry, if I wait too long to eat after a certain point, I can't anymore. I would definitely bring a quick easy snack or something if I was worried about it. Not the asshole. Your boyfriend seems like he doesn't really understand the importance of your recovery and making sure that the rules are followed to prevent a relapse. Absolutely agree. OP is being wonderfully vigilant about their recovery. It is so hard to learn to take good care of ourselves, especially after something like an eating disorder. And OP is working so hard at it. For the boyfriend to dismiss all of that because he didn't want to make his parents feel bad for being bad hosts makes him the asshole. Not the asshole, OP. This. OP, I wish you the best on your continuing recovery and congratulations on all you've achieved so far. If your boyfriend isn't supporting you and cheering you on, then it's time to reevaluate the relationship. I hope your boyfriend has some other redeeming qualities, because he's sure not coming off well from this. Not the asshole. You are exactly correct, and your boyfriend is more concerned with appearances than your well being. Update We broke up. We had a long talk about what happened, and he couldn't acknowledge that I know what's best for my recovery. He said relationships are about compromise, I said that doesn't apply to my health. He said that it applies to everything, so I said that we should give each other space. Thank you everyone. Without your comments, I wouldn't have had the confidence to stand up for myself. Next story. I have a two year old son with my ex. He was honest and told me he didn't want to be a dad and that he believed he was too selfish to be a good one. I didn't want an abortion and he said that he wouldn't force me to get one so we came to an agreement. I would have the baby and he would help me financially but I wouldn't expect anything else from him. My friend Nancy, who is a close family friend of my ex's, recently wouldn't stop asking me if my ex was my son's father since he looks like him. Only my family knows he is, and I wasn't going to tell her at first, but Nancy is one of my best friends, and I thought that I could trust her. I asked her not to tell anyone, as I didn't want it to be public knowledge. Despite agreeing not to, she ended up telling not only my ex about me supposedly hiding his baby from him, but also his entire family. It's caused a lot of issues, and my ex's family have a lawyer threatening to take my son away from me. My ex's family are influential, and I can't afford to fight them in court, so I'm genuinely terrified of them. Nancy tried to apologize to me after my ex told her that he had always known about our son. I was so angry and upset that I just yelled at her until she left. I told her she was a cow and that she had ruined my life. Nancy has been getting sympathy from some of our mutual friends who think that I was too harsh since she thought that she was doing the right thing by telling my ex, who is like family to her, that he had a child. Am I the asshole? Not the asshole at all. You and your ex made a decision between the two of you that you both feel is best for your child and yourselves. If she truly felt concern for your child and believed you were hiding this child from him, she would have only told him. But instead, she chose to air your personal situation to his family. It sounds like her goal was to start drama. You and your ex should go to court ASAP and establish a court-ordered arrangement where he agrees to pay child support and to whatever visitation agreements you two agree with. The judge doesn't have to make an arrangement for you two if you can agree to the terms of the parenting plan. This way, the family will be less likely to try and take your son, if at all. Your ex should also deal with his family in this situation and explain to them that he already knew and you two already made arrangements. As for your friend and the rest of the group, I would just send a final text and email that when you confide in someone, their recourse shouldn't be to expose you to everybody. When they prove they don't respect your privacy and violate your trust, you have no need for them in your life any longer. Express that arrangements had been made between the parents and things were peaceful, but she single-handedly brought strife into not only your life, but your child's life as well. And that's not the kind of friend or influence that you want or need. She could have asked you if he knew, but chose not to. 
She could have approached him privately, but chose not to. She wanted to look like a hero for exposing you, but there was no good deed done that day. Not the asshole. She didn't just tell your ex, but also his family. She, in knowing best, has potentially created a situation for him and a huge legal issue for you, which you not only can't afford, but also could result in you losing custody of your child. Yes, you have the right to be angry her interfering could ruin your life. Not only did she tell the ex and the family, she went and complained about the situation to mutual friends. There is an argument that could be made for sharing it with a father, not the extended family, and definitely not the mutual friends. What an asshole. Yeah, this is less, I wanted to do the right thing, and more, I wanted attention for being perceived as a person doing something noble. A person who genuinely thought they were helping would have only spoken to the ex and let him decide what to do with that information. A person who wants an audience will tell as many people as possible in an effort to soak up attention and praise. Time for the next story. I'm a single mother to an 11 year old girl. We recently got moved from the UK to America by my company and it has been quite an adjustment, but we are settling in well enough. She misses her friends and the family that we left behind, but we Zoom regularly, and she has begun to make new friends, especially after I found her a new dojang to continue her taekwondo. All in all, everything has been going fine except for one thing. Our next door neighbor is a stay-at-home mother to three girls, aged 12, 10, and 6. She is quite nosy and always poking around and trying to talk to us. I put this down to just curiosity, plus perhaps me misreading her intentions, as I'm still adjusting to how people can be here. The issue came, however, three days ago, when she came around and I let her in for some coffee. She tried to convince me to sign my daughter up to some kind of preteen beauty pageant. I won't lie, I was shocked by this. I don't know how anyone does this kind of thing, and they seem disgusting to me. I didn't want to be rude, as apparently all three of her girls do it, so I didn't share that thought, and instead, I told her that it really wasn't my daughter's cup of tea, as she is a total tomboy and is always wearing jeans and whatever gaming t-shirt that she can find. My neighbor tuttered at this and said that she had seen and commented on what a waste it was as my daughter was so pretty, and I was letting her waste her potential with all those boy things. She even tried to suggest that it was something our girls could bond over, and how she would teach her how to walk and dress, and do makeup for it, and how it would be much more fun than fighting and getting bruises. I won't lie, I was getting angry at this, and I told her that my daughter was much too young for that kind of thing, and I wouldn't force her either, as I knew that she would have no interest. She tried to say that we should ask her, and that I shouldn't make this kind of choice on my own, and implied that with how busy I must be at work, normal girly things would slip by me and it's okay. At this point I told her to get out of my house and to mind her own business, and to not dare question how I parent my daughter, bringing up that I was polite enough not to say how disgusting I think it is that she makes her daughters do those kinds of pageants. This led to a lot of gasping and shocked anger from her before she stormed out. I have had a little time to cool off since then, and maybe I snapped too easily. It's tough raising my daughter alone, and I didn't like the implication that I was failing her in some way, plus I know these shows are more common in America than the UK, so maybe I tripped over some cultural landmine. Since then, every time she sees me and my daughter, she gives us very dirty looks. Did I F up here? Should I try to mend the rift that I caused? Maybe I misread what she intended to be kind as an attack. Still not letting my daughter do pageants though. Not the asshole. Sounds like she either can't handle girls veering from the traditional uber feminine path, or one or more of her daughters was asking why they had to do those pageants when other girls like your daughter don't have to, and why couldn't they do taekwondo like your daughter? And OP replies, I had figured it might be the former. I'd not even considered the latter. I hope it's not that, as that makes me sad for them if it is. Yes, and most of us here think those pageants are gross too. Yeah, many Americans find those pageants gross, a way to sexualize young girls. They're expensive, and often used by mothers to fulfill their own sense of self-worth. I seriously question the mental health of mothers who encourage and sometimes force their young daughters to participate. 
Did you move to the southern states? Because this sounds like a very southern suburban mum vibe from the lady that you described. I'm from the south, so I'm quite familiar. Either way, not the asshole. People like this will step all over you if you don't set boundaries and expectations. They take advantage of people's instincts to be kind and non-confrontational just so they can be assholes. You are definitely not the asshole. OP replies, Tennessee is the state that we moved to. Ha, <laughs> I knew it. I'm from the South and this sort of lady, not always about beauty pageants, but the general attitude is plentiful down here. As I said, you are not the asshole. Good for you for sticking up for your daughter. Hopefully you can find some neighbors that are easier to get along with. And OP replies, there's a lovely older lady down the street who brings us baked goods. And the day we moved in brought us a casserole as we were clearly too busy to cook. So I think that I can say that we've met both sides of the spectrum. Next story. I am a 27 year old woman and I briefly dated a guy in college. He got really clingy and wouldn't let me break up with him. And I ended up moving apartments. So years later, a few times a year I get social media requests from extra accounts that he's made after I blocked him. I figured that it was him, but some sleuthing confirmed it. I just kept not approving those new follow requests and deleting anyone off my social media if I wasn't sure who they were. I also found out he got access to my work calendar for a little while by making a fake client account. Actual clients of mine can see my availability to book meetings, but he was just trying to see when I was working, I think. But I recently moved back to my old town and I joined a hiking group. And then, guess who happened to be into hiking? I damn near crapped a brick when I saw him and I just left. I took a picture before I went and I went home to figure out what to do. I didn't want this guy in my business anymore. He was honestly scaring me, but cops don't really do crap until an actual crime has happened. And making 15 fake Instagrams and showing up at one hiking group didn't seem like something they'd take seriously. So I filed a report anyway, but didn't expect it to go anywhere. Then I also unblocked him long enough to find his mom and dad's Facebook account. And when I did, I also realized he was engaged to a woman. I was pissed off first that he was being so creepy, then that he was doing that when engaged secretly. So I took my screenshots of 15 fake Instagram accounts, fake client accounts, etc. that he had made, and evidence of them being linked to his phone number, and sent them to his family and fiance, along with the picture from hiking. And I said that I dated this man in college six years ago, and multiple times a year he tries to circumvent the fact that I have him blocked on social media by making fake accounts to friend me. And he showed up where I was at, and I filed a police report, and if any of them care about him at all, they'd better talk some sense into him and tell him he best leave me alone, because if he kept coming around or trying to con me into giving him access to my life or location info on social media, I would be pursuing it legally. His parents didn't answer at first, but his fiance flipped out at me, calling me a liar. Then his parents chimed in in the group chat, saying that they would have a talk with their son, but the way that I brought this to their attention with a Facebook messenger group was insensitive. I got frustrated and said that being stalked was insensitive, and I would appreciate it if they took this up with their son instead of me. And I was trying to give them a chance to hear it from me when he still has a chance to cut it out, and not from a collect call from jail. The three of them blocked me, but I haven't heard a thing from my ex. I don't know if his family or girl believes me, but I'm hoping that the fact that they probably asked him about it scared him straight. Am I the asshole for having to put a stop to stalking like this? Not the asshole. You're already being very nice about it considering what a creep he is. If she still wants to marry him, it's really on her. Who knows? Maybe she dumps his ass and he switches target, which is also pretty horrifying. You are so not the asshole. I'm sorry that you're going through this. OP, since he probably knows that you've reached out to his family, I'm sorry to say that this is a potentially dangerous time. He might escalate and try to see you, cause problems at your work, etc. So I highly suggest contacting a local domestic violence org to get their suggestions and support. They, unfortunately, deal with this all the time, so they can provide you with ways to protect yourself and might have legal support on staff so you can get a protective order and other things to do. Wishing you lots of luck and safety and that this ass hat disappears from your life and also doesn't do the same to his fiance when she breaks up with him. 
Not only that, but let your HR know that you have a fake client, they can't do much, but will have it on record in case he tries to do anything to mess with your work. And OP says, I actually told everyone at work, my co-workers, tech support team, HR, building security, etc. So there's a lot of people looking out for me there. The tech support team always sets up an automatic logger to track every time he accesses the corporate website, the client signups or login pages, my professional profile, etc. And even gave me a little bit of code to embed on my personal website that logs it too. So I have a really big record of his internet history on any of the company owned or personal websites with my info.